Good evening, everybody. Pete Morris. This is the uh, Comanche Zoom for February 25th. This is the second in a series on uh, surviving a catastrophic engine failure. This section tonight is dealing with uh, recovery of the aircraft. In fact, I'll show you now what the uh, what the topic is all about right here. Um, Will uh, Carpenter has uh, put together two now fine, beautiful uh, presentations on dealing with the catastrophic engine failure and ending up in a bean field in Carolina, and now getting the plane out of the bean field and into a, a hangar to work on it. It's going to be very interesting. A lot of chances for questions. There are two more parts coming, so there's a lot of time to view going what's going on. So here we go. Back with the uh, who you who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Go ahead and unmute and give us the word. Uh, Dan Hom Dan Homisser, uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, a Comanche two fifty. Welcome, Dan. I suppose I could do mine. I'm Pete Morris. I'm sitting here in Connecticut. I have a Comanche 250. In fact, I have two of them. I have the one that uh, the insurance company bought after a gear up, and I have my new to me one, 1963 250, which I thoroughly enjoy. Andy White from the San Francisco Bay Area. I fly a 180. Yeah, this is Scott Morris. I fly a Comanche 250 out of uh, Coman Arrows, but I'm currently working out of Philadelphia. Go ahead, can you get a quiet spot here? Key the mic and who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Jim Brown, Calgary, 260. Jim, we've got these uh, cups that we're selling to support the Northeast tribe, 10 bucks a piece. And I'm trying to find a way of uh, being able to mail them to Canada without costing an arm and three legs. Now, the, the quote that I got from the, the uh, post office was it's going to be like 80 bucks per cup, per package. And that seems like an awful lot of money. Um, you got to unmute if you're going to talk, Jim. Can you send them to you, Arizona, in the next month? Sure. Uh, if you if you want cups, uh, you know, fill out the form and put Yuma as your address. Okay. Okay, because that'll be about nine bucks, a lot better. <laughs> yeah, you're right there. I just bought I just bought a um, engine monitor, sending it Canada four thousand oh. dollars. So that was yesterday. Didn't didn't do my heart good. I trust me. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, key the mic. Who you are? Where you are? What you fly? My name's Mike Newman. I'm from uh, Butler, Pennsylvania, uh, just north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I fly a uh, PA24 250. Uh, it's a 59, and um, I have to say that I got an email from the ICS today asking if I would rejoin. Of course, I quit a few years ago when all of this uh, political stuff started, and I expressed my opinion of the organization and uh, told them that I would not uh, support their uh, legal um, pilferage and uh, that um, I would was a proud member of the uh, Northeast tribe. That's all I had to say. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> we are we're trying very hard not to bash 
the ICS. I mean, that is our, our original parent company, if you want to call it that. But uh, it sometimes is very hard to take what they say. Go ahead, key the mic, who you are, where you are, what you fly. <laughs> I'll jump in there, it's Michael Saperton. I fly a 63 Comanche 250, the one you see here on my screen. And I'm in Phoenix, Arizona at Deer Valley Airport. In, and is, is are her end numbers showing up the right way to you guys? They, they're mirrored for me. Just... Right now, we're just seeing your name on the screen. Oh, really? You don't see? Oh, sorry about that. <sighs> I'm supposed to be the Zoom expert, too. <laughs> there we go. There you go. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't finish the process. Anyway, I'm sorry I missed last week's conversation. It sounded great. I kind of got a piece of it and I was working still, so I couldn't really uh, enjoy the entire terror that poor guy went through. It's all on the website if you want to yeah. look at the, re the recording. Yeah, no, I, am, I, I intend on going back there and doing that. I did buy seatbelt. I did buy shoulder harnesses for the Comanche. Yay. Yay. I didn't get them installed yet. Hi, CJ. <laughs> Good news. Did you get yeah. Alpha or did you get Phil Air? I went to Alpha. Phil Air wasn't going to have any for until April or May. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And they have the much better price, by the way. Well, that the last group buy, uh, you know what? There's still some stuff happening on the group buy, and we may still be able to get a better group rate. Um, this this one got a little bit messed up, so yeah, I'm I'm probably partially responsible for not reading the the post carefully because as soon as oh, I saw it, was it, was you. Like, I, it was me. I jumped right in there and called them, and they were very very nice to me. Yeah, Actually, I think no. that was it because I talked to Paula and she was like, "What is this?" So, you know, I got I'm getting these calls that there's a group buy, and I'm like, "I'm so sorry." We were gathering interest, and so, anyways, we ended up spending like an hour talking and catching up, and um, and so we're expecting you know some some stuff back. Well, you, you might have missed on the great prices, but last time um, Alpha really stepped up and and was able to do a discount, and they had very similar prices, so we're not sure because they it's a different situation now with materials shortages that they didn't have at the time of the last one right but i know they're going to do their best and we have so much interest i think there were 50 responses as you know on the uh paper comanche facebook group yeah that um we may be able to help with uh supply chain management and that always helps us because they'll pass along some of that discount to us well, that's fantastic. I don't know if they'll do a retroactive discount. I bought two sets. I bought one set for Bert's. He has two. Uh, he has a PA thirty and a thirty nine with counter no rotating flat. Oh, prop. poor thing. I know that. <laughs> so I, I put an order in for him. I, I said, if how, how about I pay you with uh, for your annual with uh, with some seatbelts? And he said, oh, well, I'll take it. <laughs> Great. Oh, I love it. Cool. Um, well, hey, everybody, jump in and say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Hello, I'm uh, Derek Jenkins from uh, Manitoba, Canada. Oh. And Derek, what do you yeah, fly? Uh, Derek Jenkins from uh, Manitoba, Canada. Am I coming Welcome through? Welcome, and thanks for being here. You're loud and clear, Derek. Yeah. What are you flying out of Manitoba? Oh, or good. Okay. Flying? I have a uh, six. I have a sixty-one uh, two hundred and fifty. I got it almost three years ago. Had a Cherokee one hundred and forty for twelve years before that, and uh, we <laughs> traveled quite, quite a, a lot with it. We traveled from Manitoba to uh, the Bahamas twice, and uh, from here to California twice. You and, are uh, getting around. So I'm. Uh, yeah, I always like traveling, and uh, I even, my first airplane was an air coop, and I had it to, uh, down to Texas and Arizona back in 93. Well, and now you're doing it three times faster in the Comanche. 
Air coops are great, but yeah. they're not Well, the, the Cherokee, no, it was just me and my baggage in those days. But uh, yeah, we traveled uh, twice to the Bahamas and then twice to California, wherever we were spending about three months in the winter. And then uh, it was, well, it had about 2,400 hours on the engine. So I, uh, I knew we wanted to get a little more speed and payload. So I kind of, uh, I was looking, I, I considered a uh, beach debonair and then the Comanche was comparable. And uh, even the one winter I, I looked at two different ones down there uh, around San Diego and Tulare, California. And then, um, oh, I followed up on some ads, but there was always some issues that would have been made a, an import difficult. Like the, the one didn't have very good documentation on the overhaul. And uh, like they, they wanted to have a, a complete work order and a parts list and not just a half a page that said certificate of overhaul. So I, I walked away from that one and ended up, but this one I got was already in Canada. And the expensive stuff ahead of the firewall was in, in good shape. Like it had uh, an overhaul in 2010 and it had 230 hours on it. And, and the propeller had been new in 06 and overhauled in 16. So that was a good, good starting point. So we need a, uh, somewhere on my list is, is a paint job. It sat outside for, for a while in the, with the previous owner. But uh, we'll, we'll see, see when that comes along. Well, Derek, we have a Comanche Zoom coming up specifically on paint. So um, we'll, be, we'll be listing and inviting everybody oh, to good. that as it comes up. So yeah, well, welcome. And thank you for being here, Derek from Manitoba. And uh, congratulations on choosing a Comanche. Yeah, uh, one, one more thing. I, I know, yeah, I heard your discussion about the uh, shoulder harness. And that was one of the first things I did as soon as I got the plane. I, uh, I, put the, I had to put the alpha belts in because in the Cherokee, I had put the BAS system in. I really liked that, but they didn't have an STC for the Comanches. Uh, I liked it because of the, uh, the four point and I got the rotary buckle. Yeah. One problem I do notice with the alpha belt belts, if you reach down to uh, the fuel selector, when you, it's very easy to accidentally uh, flip the, the buckle and uh, release it. Um, that, that'll, uh, that's a good, good highlight. I'm going to be talking with the alpha folks and I'll try to remember to pass that on. So, well, let me, um, let me see if I can get other folks who are here to say who they are, where they are and what they fly. Any quiet moment, just jump in. <clears throat> Hello, I'm James Harder. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, James. Welcome. Yeah, from uh, Calgary. I've got a PA30 turbocharged. And uh, what I would like to hear some discussion about is these new airbags that they've got built into the seat belts. And I'm wondering whether they would be worth, uh, worthwhile uh, improvement. Yes. Okay. So in short on that, um, Alpha Aviation does have the STC for the AMSAFE airbags. And um, so they're in Minnesota. And I will post their phone number into the uh, chat window. If you're able to look at the chat window, look for if you're on an iPhone or a uh, tablet, there'll be three dots. Otherwise, look for the word chat. And uh, you can give them a call and look at ordering the STC for the MC Fairbanks. How many so people are in. how many how many people are putting them in and are they are they worthwhile? That's my thing. Because they're quite costly. And the people in Calgary here have never put a set in. So if I put a set in, I'd be the first one. I'd be the guinea uh, pig. So they'd be uh, the labor costs would be pretty high up here. Uh, could be in Calgary. It's quite involved, is, as I, as I, yeah, there is a Western Canada installer for Alpha, and um, if you talk to Alpha, they had put together a not complete list that did include a Western Canada installer that was familiar with the Alpha Aviation seatbelts. And so, um, call uh, Paula has taken over for her father Don, and uh, and can give you. How the are all our members? On. How are all our members feeling about the? 
how are all the members feeling about the airbag? Do they think it's a worthwhile thing? I mean, I've I'm got the shut shoulder up and let somebody had years who's years. got some. Yeah, no, I'm going to be quiet. Does anybody who's here right now, and it looks like we've got about uh, a little under 40 people here. Has anybody got the airbags installed? Feel free to I mean, unmute and them jump in. If, if we needed them. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Josh. Welcome. And who's next to you? Hi, I'm Katie. I'm Josh's wife, who just is oh, hi. here for the meetings. K Katie, it is a pleasure. Well, good to see you and Josh. Um, Always nice so, to be here. Yeah. Should. It's generally not a good good, good process to install them retroactively. I, I <laughs> <laughs> After the event. <laughs> uh, Scott Kenyon is actually here saying that he's his planes mostly have airbags installed new from the factory. Um, so that's not very helpful. Scott, you're going to have to talk to us about adding them to uh, retroactively to a command sheet before they're needed. Um, I will, um, I'll put a quick note out and see if I can't get an answer for you and then I'll post it yeah. in the chat window. Um, hey, good, thank STC you. Yeah, and I'll take a look, uh, as soon as I'm not needing to talk, I'll take a look because I do have pricing on that from two years ago and it won't have changed too much. So, I see Jay. Um, this is Margie, and um, I I didn't have the uh, airbag seat belts, but a friend of mine did in his uh, Cardinal, and I flew a lot with him with the with the those kind of seat belts. The only thing I can say is they're a little bulky, um, and you know, but they were okay. Uh, we never actually used them because we never had any accidents, which was a good thing. But <laughs> they, they do take up a little bit more room. They're, they're kind of bulky across, you know, the shoulder one that comes across your front is real thick and it's got a big padding thing in it. So I, I don't know how they would actually work in an accident, but they were okay. Yeah, I actually, Margie, thank you for jumping in. And do you wanna just go ahead and finish your introduction? By the way, Margie, I just wanna, say a special mention to you because of your willingness to help with the uh, wings credit, the FA wings credit. And I owe you a call because we do have finally got our calendar sorted out for the next couple of months. Oh, great. Um, yep, yep. But say who you are and where you are and what you fly. And then I'm going to uh mention one thing about the uh, airbags that Pat Kiefer sent me that'll be of interest to any of us who are not tall. But go ahead, okay. Margie. Okay, this is Margie Liggett. I'm in the Tri-Cities in Washington State. And we have a Comanche 250 in 1964. And we just finished the 1000 hour gear AD. Just got that this week. So we're excited to finally have that over with. Well done and uh, welcome. And do you wanna just, cause I know there's a million people interested, roughly how much time, and if you know how much expense did you have for yours? It varies depending on how it is, but. Yeah, we had it done in Oregon uh, at Twin Oaks, which is south of Hillsboro, if anybody's familiar with the Northwest. And it cost us, oh gosh, we, we also had to have a, a bladder replaced too. That was about a thousand dollars there. So uh, it took him 65 hours working on the gear AD so you figure 65 hours times $115 an hour. And plus the, he replaced a lot of the bolts and the bushings and, and uh, all kinds of things in it. So it, it cost us all together with everything about $12,000. Oh my, okay, got it. So yours is on the higher end of most of the uh, thousand hour gear ADs that I've heard of, but uh, it's, I think we're going to have to do a survey and put a price range together so that folks know. Uh, Margie, thanks a lot. Um, so the, for those that are wondering about um, airbags, the one piece of feedback that I did get, which was very helpful from Pat Kiefer, um, who has them in the, or tried to get them into the twin command or a previous airplane was for those that are not tall and Pat is five foot four inches, they were not able to get it so that the um, airbag was not threatening the carotid artery. So if you are a short person, um, that would be the one caution. And uh, they actually had the engineer come out. 
it's possible that that's changed. So don't take it as gospel. They may have fixed it since then. But that was the only caution I heard. Um, okay, so, so just jump in. Say who, uh, This was in reference to the fact that we're working on the survey for the next shoulder harness group by and uh, some very helpful information that there, there is a backlog on uh, materials, but uh, that both vendors are willing to work with us, very supportive of the Comanches. So if you're interested in a, in a shoulder harness, um, Pete, can you put up, a, if you're able, the link, tell them where to go for the, to fill out the form. Hi, CJ. This is Rich Bergman checking in on a junk computer, 9242 Papa, Southern California. That's why I wasn't on last week. I killed my good one and I got a new one coming, but this one here I dragged out of the closet, beat it up a little bit, put Zoom on it, took three and a half hours to up, uh, bring Windows up to date. And here we are, one beat up old Toshiba. I'll Rich, copy. you look great. I'll copy. So okay. <laughs> Okay, Welcome, Rich. Thanks I'll for being here. Go ahead and share the website with you. This is our website here at northeastcomanche.org. If you go there, you will be able to get this screen. This down here in the left hand, uh, right hand corner is New England uh, NE form links. And on that form link, there's a seatbelt group by survey right here. There is also the Sun and Fun. Uh, registration form. This is for Comanche That's Town. That's for Comanche Town. Comanche yep. Town. This is not for Sun and Fun itself. But if you want to, you know, reserve a spot in, at Comanche Town, this is where you go to do it. Also, there's a cup order form. We're, we're selling cups to uh, help uh, the Northeast tribe. In fact, this is what the form looks like. Oh, shoot. And uh, Am I still there, CJ? You are. Okay, because my computer is telling me I'm not. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the cup order form looks like, I mean, the cup itself looks like this without the, the dotted lines. This is the, uh, the, the mock-up they did for the art. But without the dotted lines, that's what the cup looks like. And uh, we're selling them for $10 a piece or more as a donation and we can mail it to you for about nine bucks in the United States. We haven't yet figured out how to mail it across the, the, the uh, international lines. It's uh, the last I heard, it was about 80 bucks to send it to Canada. So that's, that's not gonna, not gonna be a possibility. Oh, we'll, we'll fix that. There are better ways. Uh, I just wanna mention to uh, you, Pete, that uh, Pete mentioned that this is the challenge cup. And since I just saw uh, Colonel Jim Walcott just join the, the uh, Zoom, I want to acknowledge that that idea came from Colonel Walcott. And uh, if he wants to unmute and say who he is, where he is, and what he flies, and a little bit about challenge coins, I'm going to invite a, uh, an off-topic speech for a moment. Jim, if you're willing to describe challenge coins, I invite you to just give us a quick overview because it's a cool thing. There's, there's nothing like dialing in and then just being thrown right into the fire. Hey, you know what? We love you, buddy. Yeah. Enjoy. Good to be with you. Uh, Jim Wolcott, um, I fly a 1969 uh, 260C um, down in uh, near Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, just so relative newcomer to Comanches. Uh, I'm in the, in the process of actually purchasing, uh, purchasing one. So I'm going to be in it probably in the next week or so uh, fully. So i um, very excited about that. But uh, CJ and I had talked earlier. Uh, I'm retired Air Force and we had uh, challenge coins um, that were kind of a camaraderie thing and morale boosters and they were coins that uh, had different units on them and different sayings and things like that and the, the whole the whole genesis of it was back in World War II supposedly uh, pilots all carried different bottle caps of the beer they'd been drinking and so they would uh, challenge each other with it so now they're widespread everywhere and it's even well beyond the aviation community and uh I thought that might be an interesting thing for, for the group of the Comanche drivers. I've never seen a, a group of people so dedicated. This is very exciting. I got to be honest with you. Um, and so the purpose of the coin is it's kind of a large coin. Uh, it would be stamped with like a Comanche, maybe a Twinko on the back and a saying or something relevant to the group and what we think about Comanches. And the whole key was you always have it on you. Um, so if you're out somewhere, whether you're a fly-in or a breakfast or you're just transit, 
uh, and you happen to bump into somebody, if they, if they challenge you with their coin to see if you have yours, uh, if you don't happen to have yours on you, well, then you end up buying a beverage of the other person's choice. Um, I will tell you, it can get pretty crazy. Uh, I've seen times where we've actually set people up knowing they didn't have a coin and they bought quite a few drinks. So it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's something you like to kind of have on you. It shows you're part of a group. Um, so I've kicked a couple ideas to CJ and, sh and we're looking at it. And so maybe get some input from the, the entire group about some ideas, but uh, it's a fun thing. I've always had one in the Air Force. And, and uh, like I said, it's spread now well beyond the aviation community. So yeah, if I and now you know whose that, fault I, it is. <laughs> I could add to that, CJ, because uh, I was familiar with this challenge coin. My, my son was in the Air Force and my daughter was in the uh, Coast Guard and also in the, uh, the uh, Washington State National Guard. And that's where we, I learned about the, the, the challenge idea. With a cup, what we're doing is saying that if you show up at a fly-in with your cup and the other person doesn't have a cup, they owe you a cup of coffee or something like that. They got to fill the cup. Uh, and if you're, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, helicopter going by right now, so you can hear it definitely in the background. No lights, dark, but anyhow, uh, that's that's where I got the idea. So, you know, I, I agree totally. Cool. Well, so welcome, and now you all know. Oh. Get your mug, show up at a fly-in with it, and uh, make other guys buy the beer. <laughs> or, <laughs> or not buy the beer. A cup and you don't have to fill theirs. Right, exactly. Anyways, everybody jump in, say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Hey, CJ, on the topic of challenge coins. Oh, Rob, welcome. Hi, nice to see you again. So I, I was involved in the, some discussions earlier about uh, forced landings and so forth at the early seminar. And uh, when I was renewing my CFI, one of the FAA inspectors up here in the Oakland district contacted my wife to set up an appointment and I said call her because you know she kind of runs things <laughs> and uh, he was an ex-military guy and when, when, when he told me the uh, when, when she told him the story of our forced landing in the in the Grumman Tiger this guy said well you know that that's pretty good I'm glad you did that and he awarded me with this thing I don't know if you can see it but it's as close as he could get to a challenge coin. He's ex-military and uh, I was very honored for him to present this to me. This is not normally released to the public. It's used in house by the FAA to award, uh, you know, the uh, inspectors there for, you know, above and beyond. But uh, he slipped this to me and it was, it was, uh, you know, it's fairly significant because I thought it was pretty cool that the FAA would give a pilot something like that for safely delivering an airplane, you know, onto a, during a forced landing. So anyway, um, they're, they're pretty significant when you get one. And uh, I, I, I was very honored to get it. I just wanted to show, show everybody that. Rob, that is really cool. Welcome and thanks for showing us and thanks for being here. Uh, that, that, um, you know, one thing we need to do, I think, as a, as a pilot group is really honor people that, that come through in emergencies because there's always that, that uh, you know, oh, well, I'm a pilot, I'm trained to do that, I'm trained to do that. But, uh, you know, when you do pull off something good, uh, we should all be very, uh, I don't know, si significantly impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was I was quite honored that an FAA inspector would hear the story as related to from my wife about my really I mean I'll tell the story of my my off airport land well it was an on airport landing because I managed to glide to an airport but I had ideal circumstances for my my catastrophic engine failure and. Uh, a lot of people don't get that ideal circumstances, manage to pull it off. And I really wish there was some sort of recognition uh, informally or formally we could give to, to, to pilots and aviators, even though, you know, we're 
ah, we're pilots and all that stuff. It is nice to be appreciated. So anybody who's out there, if you have had a, a situation and, and you've managed to pull it off, uh, my kudos to you. And I wish I could give all of you one of these things, but not, not in my, uh, my universe to do that. So thank you. Uh, if you're a safe pilot and you follow process and you yes. know that happens for you. You know, I, uh, we're, we're just about to uh, 730, but I want to thank Rob for that idea. And um, Rob, if you don't mind, I'm, we're going to try to reach out to you because we should be able to do something like that. Maybe yeah. a, it, as Jim Walcott just said, maybe a safety coin or maybe a safety mug. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, if you pull it off and you save a Comanche and you particularly if you save yourselves and everybody, um, let's, let's do some fundraising and get, get a, um, and, I was and get that very honored to get it. Maybe we could we could we could do something like this from from you know Comanche Town or something, and and uh, celebrate uh, the survival of some of our fellow aviators and their passengers. <laughs> I think that is a great idea. I really do. Um, cool. Okay. It's going on to the budget list, which we're putting together of projects that support our aircraft and general aviation officially. Fantastic idea. And you are now tagged <laughs> uh -oh. being part of the team. All right. I'm going to, um, I'm going to, in a moment, uh, actually, Pete, if you don't mind, I'm just, um, I was going to jump in and say really briefly that uh, we do a test flight the night before uh, on all of these Comanche Zooms. And last night, what became apparent unexpectedly, I think, to most of us is that the information that Will is going to be giving us tonight can make such a substantial difference in the actual cost of recovering and repairing or restoring an, a Comanche that it may save a significant number of Comanches that gear up. So, and, the, and, and he's gonna share some of the critical information that he sort of uncovered in this process. If you have an a &P that you can text that can join this Comanche Zoom, it turns out that there's about a potential $10,000 savings. And that may make the difference between the insurance company needing to total your aircraft and the insurance company agreeing to repair it. So, but that teaser and that plea to, if you have an a &P, um, that you think might have a moment to jump in, uh, to then to uh, go ahead and text them and say, come on and join. And I'll go ahead and paste the join information into the window. Um, thanks, you guys, and Will, uh, welcome. Thanks, CJ. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I'm very familiar with the, the coin discussion. As an attorney, those are the questions that I get all the time, and I'm always like, oh, God, not again. Um, <laughs> there's just a lot of rules that the military has governing the, the distribution and purchase, and anyway, that's a different issue. Um, but thanks for having me again, CJ, and for those of you that aren't familiar, I did the previous Zoom session uh, last week. I put my plane down in a field in uh, St. Paul's, North Carolina, back in November. Uh, the engine, you know, blew up on me. You know, broke the uh, one of the connecting rods, punched a hole in the crankcase. Pretty good size. I got I got some better pictures of it from. Uh, but there Will, I'm sorry. I just un I just muted you. I'm sorry. No, it, it, it's a, it, it's nice. It gives me an alert. It gives me a heads up that that's happening. I'll go ahead and share my screen here as well. But uh, so the first kind of the first in the series was discussing, you know, the the engine failure and kind of the dealing with the emergency. And then, you know, next in the sequence is the, the natural next step is the recovery process. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through the ins and outs of that and try to arm everybody in this group with some information. So that way, if you find yourself in the same situation that I found myself in, you have an idea of what to expect and what to do, and you're not kind of left guessing and, um, you know, just kind of flapping in the breeze. But uh, I, yeah, this is, uh, you know, on the left, you have the picture of the initial recovery from the field uh, in St. Paul's. They actually pulled the plane out of the brush. It was in the brush that's directly off to the left of the frame. And then in the right image, you have them dropping it off. Um, let's go through here. So here's my agenda. I'm going to go through. Uh, oh, yeah, and let me, let me lead off by saying that there's, there's a lot of um, 
this may raise a lot of questions or you may have had different experiences with your engine failures and your recoveries and stuff like that. Uh, please throw those comments in the chat as you think of them. I'm just for the, to, to get through the information, I'm just gonna run through the presentation like I did last time, but make sure we capture it in the chat so we can you know, address it later. And uh, there, there's some points where I'll, I'll actually ask specific questions if you, know, if you guys have information, if you could share it. But you know, this, a lot of this presentation is very anecdotal. It's based on my personal experience. Um, and then the, you know, what I've learned from others throughout the process. But if your, you know, experiences may differ, so please feel free to uh, chime in and post a comment in like, you know, if you had a complete opposite experience, we want to make sure we capture that. So I just want to say that up front. Um, okay. So let's get going. So I'll go through some initial considerations for when you first are trying to think about the, uh, the recovery process almost like a mental checklist of things you should be thinking. Um, this is definitely not probably a checklist you'd keep in your plane. I mean, you could, I guess, uh, just throw it in the back or something. Um, then I'm gonna go, go talk about picking your team and that's your recovery team to the extent you have uh, any influence over that. We'll talk about choosing the delivery site, the, the delivery site, what happens uh, during the recovery process, like what happens to the aircraft. Um, I'm gonna try to set your expectations regarding you know, damage and issues you'll uncover. Uh, after the fact, we'll talk about, I mean, this is the, the important part is we're talking about ways to minimize those issues. And then I'll talk about the delivery and then I'll kind of do a, a little AAR, tell you what went well with mine and what, what I could have done differently. So this is Will's first rule of aircraft recovery. It's also probably the government's, um, but don't move the aircraft until the FAA tells you you can. And the reason that matters is because it, you never know what they're going to want to investigate. It's it's a crapshoot. There's some things that they'll want to look at, even if there's no damage, um, you know, no injuries, nothing. They'll want to investigate it. Maybe, maybe unbeknownst to you know you, the pilot, there've had there's been a series of these kinds of failures, and they just want to get more information on yours. Then they want to go out on the ground. Um, that's probably not the case, but uh, in, in, but if you have injuries or serious property damage, then you can expect them to want to look into it. But uh, definitely don't move the plane until they give you the green light. And that's just the conversation you have with the FISDO. And the, I mean, the FISDO that I worked with was very uh, straightforward, forthcoming. He you know, kind of let me control my timeline and just said, let me know when you're going to, uh, when you're gonna move the plane. And I let him know and I, he, I asked me any issues. He said, no, go right ahead. So I'm, I'm gonna give you kind of a brief overview of the scheduling process for what the recovery actually looks like kind of from start to finish, at least getting everything lined up, and, you know, scheduled. Um, so the first thing you have to do after you file the, uh, um, or excuse me, after you have your emergency and you've, you've settled down, you're, you've done dealing with all the random passerbys that are just coming to ask you questions or whatever, or even do it before then if there's nobody there. I think I called my carrier before the, uh, I got inundated with you know, random people stopping to ask me what was, was happening and causing traffic jams on the highway. And, but Call your, and this is something I'd recommend everybody has. I'd recommend you keep the number for a point of contact at your insurance carrier in your phone. You never know when you need it, but you call to file the claim. And then as soon as you file the claim, the insurance, uh, the person receiving the claim is going to basically put your claim out to an adjuster. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the process, an adjuster is similar to other industries. It's used, they're used the same way. They're just a third party uh, intermediary between the insurance company and the person, in this case, the pilot, um, and they're hired by the insurance company. The insurance company pays them, but they, they owe no loyalties to the insurance company. And I think it's important to understand that. So when you try to ask them for advice or information, they're generally not going to uh, be too helpful because they're just trying to, you know, they're right down the middle. But we will talk about that in a later Zoom, we talk about the insurance. The adjuster will then reach out to you and contact you. Um, and then he's going to ask you, about the initial considerations I'm about, I'm about to tell you about. So this is why it's important that you kind of make a mental note of all these things that are going on around you. Um, so you can try to get the adjust adjuster as much information as quickly as possible because the more information he or she has, the quicker they can schedule your recovery, the quicker your plane can get out of whatever you know, situation it's in and you know, the quicker it gets into the shop and repairs and so on. Um, it, you have to keep close contact with the FISDO. So just like the adjuster is the, you know, the middleman between or, or woman between the insurance company and the pilot, you are the middle person between 
the FISDO and the adjuster. So the adjuster is not going to call the FISDO. You got to do that relaying the information and get the approval to the adjuster. And the approval is simple, a simple email saying, hey, the FA, you know, the FISDO green lighted, we can move the plane. Um, and there you go. Let the adjuster know when the green light, when you get the green light to move the plane. And then the adjuster will generally coordinate with the recovery team, you know, as provided in your insurance policy. And this is where I'd recommend just reviewing your policy to see uh, what's actually allowed and it, it can help set your expectations with what's going to happen, you know, throughout the process. Um, so here's some initial considerations, you know, right after the emergency, you're on the ground. I'm going to go through, you know, what, what I would, you know, in hindsight, what I would recommend people do, and then I'll, you know, relate it back to my, uh, my specific situation. So the first question is how much damage you have to the airplane in the, the important issue here is, is the plane totaled or is it salvageable? Um, Sometimes this is really hard to tell. If you knowingly underinsure your plane um, and you have a hard landing, that you, I should say underinsure your Comanche and you have a hard landing, well, there's a, a hard landing inspection for the Comanche that I'm going through. And I, I can tell you it's pretty expensive. So if you're underinsuring your plane, um, that, that could be you know, the, the straw that breaks your back right there. It's just the fact that you don't have enough coverage. But you also have to look at the, I mean, is the plane on its belly? And it, it, this, a lot of these questions are, aren't very readily apparent. They're not very, the answers aren't very obvious. So you have to look at your own situation. Now, if you bulge your plane up and it's in the, you know, in the corner of a field or something, you know, that, those are easy questions. The, the adjuster will plan accordingly. But if the plane is not totaled or there's a good, you know, it looks like it's not totaled, the adjuster is going to err on the side of recovering the plane to kind of assess the damage, so to speak. Um, and the reason that matters is it also matters. Yeah, it matters how they approach the plane. It matters how they, you know, it affects the schedule. Uh, but the next thing I would ask you to consider is where is the plane located? And the important question I'm asking you here is public or private property. That's kind of like the, the first issue. If you're on a road, also a relevant factor because it affects the recovery. But if it's on public property, you have to, you have to figure out who the controlling agency is. Is it a municipality? Is it a public, like water utility company, whoever it may be? Because you got to get their permission. I mean, you enter the property without permission, but you know you had, you know, I'm, for those I, that I did say at the beginning, I'm, I'm an attorney for the army, but so it, you, you had an emergency, so you legally got into their property. Now you got to legally get your plane out of the property. So you got to work with them. Um, the same goes for private property as well. You have to communicate with the. Uh, the owner, you know, just to let them know, like, hey, you're, there's a plane in your field, or you know, you know, on your your front lawn. And I think I took out your mailbox. Um, a team's going to come in, recover the plane, and is there any issues there? So you just got to be aware of that. Uh, is the plane leaking fluids? And this is an important issue that the adjuster is going to ask you at the very beginning because it affects the recovery timeline. It affects the cost of the claim, the insurance claim, because now you're talking about like an environmental cleanup, um, it's going to and it's going to affect the timeline because the insurance care the adjuster is going to try to get out to the plane quicker to stop kind of stop the bleeding so to speak. Um, but if it's not leaking fluids, then it's you know it, it, it can sit. They they have more flexibility with how they schedule uh, the recovery. And then it also another reason it can affect the claim is not only environmental cleanup, but now if you're leaking 100 low lead on a farmer's field, and that you know we have I just use that example because. That's where I put my plane, and that's where I think a lot of people would choose to put their plane if they're in the middle of nowhere. Um, you're not, you're now damaging their crops as well, um, and yeah, and it also affects the equipment that they need to come, you know, dig out the the uh, the soiled the soiled soil, the contaminated soil, um, just to reduce the claim, reduce kind of like you know reduce the extent of the damage. Um, the next question is your real or personal property damage. Did you, you know, you, you had a great landing, you, you, you walked away from it, but did you, did you take out a, uh, a mailbox, a fence? Uh, did you hit a car? Um, I mean, it could even be something like, did you take out like the family tree in the backyard that had been growing for centuries or something like that? So there's all kinds of stuff that all kinds of things that are implicated here. So you just have to kind of do your best to, to assess the damage up front because these are the things the adjuster is going to be asking you over the phone. Another question is, will the recovery cause more damage to the property? 
um, not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just something you have to be aware of. So if, you know, if there were somebody, an example that I guess the extreme example would be you put your plane on a golf course. Well, generally the equipment used to recover planes is tracked, it's heavy. Um, they're gonna be driving a vehicle out on a golf course and the golf courses aren't rated for that. Maybe your plane happened to stop, stop on like the ninth green. So th there's all these different considerations that, you know, the recovery could potentially cause more damage, which would increase the cost of the claim. Um, and I'll talk more about the insurance claims and uh, limits and all those kinds of things in the in a later Zoom as well. I think that'll be the last one in the series. Um, and then the, the important question, you know, if there's going to be more damage, does anybody care? So here's the field I put the, put the plane down in. And for those who missed it, I came in from the right and then I landed basically coming right at the camera. Um, and then that's the other side. You know, that's me turning around looking at it. But you can see there's a farmer's field here. It had been plowed about two weeks prior. Um, the plane was completely salvageable. There's very little damage. The plane was on private property. You know, it, it, and, you know where is the, another point I wanna make here that I, I didn't put in the slide was figuring out where the, the plane is like public or private property. An easy way to get after that is to just contact the local sheriff or police department. They can go around and help you knock on doors. I'd actually encourage that because you know, as a little, as a tangent here, when I walked out of this field, you know, I was walking up to these houses, just knocking on doors saying, hey, do you know who owns this field? Whose property is this? And, you know, the people I talked to said, no, no, no. And then I actually went down the road here to the left. <laughs> At this point, it was like five o'clock. It was getting dark. And I, got, I see some lights on in a house. I go knock on a door. And I mean, I'm, I'm out in the country here, obviously. And uh, this guy kind of like skittishly comes from you know, pokes his head out behind the storm door and he's like how he's like what can i do for you and i was like oh i'm the pilot i just put my plane down in the field over there i'm just trying to figure out who owns this land um and he's like oh and he starts talking to me and he's like still standing behind the door he's like oh he's like let me put this away and he like pulls out a pistol that he had been holding <laughs> it's like yeah we get some weirdos around here and i was like okay i was like whatever i'm glad i'm not in that category or you don't think i am um but he was very helpful but the you know it was that was my own experience, but the, the sheriffs did try to help me figure out who owned the property. Um, but it ended up being a woman that was about a mile away from, uh, you know, these houses that are right in front of the frame. My plane wasn't leaking any fluids. I, you know, looked around underneath it. It wasn't, you know, there weren't any issues. And, uh, you know, the way the end result there was that the plane, if it hadn't leaking fluids, it probably would have been recovered very quickly. But since it wasn't, you know, the 5th of um, November was a Thursday. So that's when the plane went down. Uh, it wasn't actually recovered until a Monday. And so my, those were five long nights that or what is it, four long nights that my plane spent out in the field. It was cold. Um, I had no real or personal property damage. You, you can see I did put some ruts in the, uh, in the dirt from where I was dragging the, the gear, dragging the brakes, or excuse me, dragging the tires when I walked the brakes. Um, I brought that up to the farmer. I, you know, when, when I found out who she was, I went to her, went to her house. She was also a little apprehensive about this stranger that was coming up to her door. And I explained what happened. Um, very nice woman. She said that she was leasing the field. I, you know, she said she was glad it was okay. Didn't, you know, very, very nice. Wasn't trying to like, uh, you know, nickel and dime the insurance company. And I asked if it'd be okay if, you know, we had the plane, you know, equipment driven out on the field for a plane to come back and recover it a few days later. She's like, not a problem. The only thing she wanted was she wanted me to tell her when the recovery was going to happen just because she just wanted to come out with her friends and watch it. Um, and that's, yeah, I was happy to tell her when that, when that happened. And then the, uh, so that, you know, it's just kind of the rest of the questions. There was no personal property damage, personal real property damage, really. Um, and she didn't care if there was more damage. And the, the recovery team did very little damage uh, additional based on the, the images I saw. So picking the team. So, this is where experiences can differ. So generally, you know, owners don't have much of a say in the process. It's, co it's controlled by the insurance company. So they're the ones that, that pay the bill. Um, and th this is kind of a warning point for me. You, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you can, as an owner, influence who you hire as a recovery team. And someone may be able to answer this question in the chat. But based on my other experiences re recovering the aircraft, and you you'll see this in a minute, um, working with the insurance company, they were willing to pay up to, you know, whatever they would pay. So I imagine if you ask your adjuster, can I hire my own recovery team? 
he would have to get a quote from the standard recovery team that the insurance company uses and then say, okay, we'll pay for the recovery team up to this amount. If you want to pick somebody that's more money, you're responsible for it because that's the way they handled the cost of the recovery. And I'll talk about that in a later slide. But if, if you have a specific experience uh, that differs or, and you, you were able to affect this outcome in some way, please throw it in the chat. We, we definitely want to hear about it at the end. Um, so what to look for when you're picking a recovery team? A lot of this won't come as a, a surprise to really anybody. You want to experience the make and model, just like picking a, a shop. Um, and you can usually figure out if they have worked with a Comanche based on their time estimate. If they say like it's going to take eight hours to recover the plane, that's not a good sign. I'll tell you that. Because I think my quote was about 14 and a half and talking to some folks um, around that time about the recovery time for Comanche, that was kind of, that was, that was close to what it should be, 14 and a half hours. Uh, just to recover the plane. That's not including any of the movement. Um, do they have the equipment to do the job? I mean, you, you, I mean, the example that I would give is if the plane is in six feet of water, there's a recovery team that you're interested in have the equipment to do it. So you, you could be have a great, um, a great recovery team that knows Comanches that can't get to the plane because they lack the equipment. I mean, this is this was relevant for me. Can they can the recovery team take the plane where you want it to? Uh, just like you know, picking a shop, they have positive referrals. And did I get a vote? Uh, I don't know. I, I didn't think I did, so I acted as though I did not, and I basically took what was uh, what was given to me by the by the adjuster. He did tell me that the shop had experience with Comanches, and, and based on the recovery and the relatively small amount of damage, you'll hear me complain about the damage later. But all things considered, it's a pretty small amount of damage for um, the amount of work they did, the conditions they they were operating in. So I, I would say that was a stroke of luck for me. Just had a series of series of luck. Well, I guess I had really bad luck followed by some good luck. You know, if you look at the entire picture. So when you choose the delivery site, you know, an important question to ask yourself is, what does your insurance policy say? Some will say, I mean, it's the CJR talked about this before. It, it's like triple A. You know, if you're broken down on the side of the road, does your insurance policy say it'll take you to the next, you know, net, next gas station, the next dealer or does it say it'll take you to your home uh, um, your home airport so that that's what you, something you got to look in your insurance policy helps to set the expectation early on because mine wasn't what I thought it was uh, you'll see that in a moment um, what's the cost of the delivery going to be and the reason this matters is because what I was saying before can you pay to have it taken further um, that's just, just a simple question you can have to um, you can you can ask the adjuster and they'll very candidly tell you if, if you can or you can't. Um, usually they're gonna let you take it further, but you're gonna be paying for it out of pocket. So the recovery, I mean, and, it, and it's not even a, uh, it's not a big issue to ask the question either. And the, the reason I'd say that is because the adjuster is going to get a quote from the recovery team they use, whoever they elect to use. And it's really easy for the recovery team just to quote the additional distance. Now, if you can pick the, de the delivery site, I you know, like any a and or like any shop you go to, to work on your plane, you're gonna wanna interview the mechanic, ask them if they have Comanche experience. Uh, if they don't, which, you know, they might not based on where you put your plane down. Um, I would, and this is, this is a key point here that I would kind of impress upon everybody is I rec strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you, if the a and is not intimately familiar with Comanches. If the a and can't sit in a, in a shop and look at a pile of parts and tell you exactly what parts go to which parts of the aircraft, um, and they don't have that kind of in-depth knowledge with the Comanche, it is highly advisable that they go out to look at the plane and, and observe the disassembly just because they can see where all the pieces are going and they can see uh, how it all, you know, how, you know, see how it comes apart, how it goes back together. Very, very strong recommendation there. Um, it's also very useful to have a, a shop that's very familiar with the insurance process. Now, it's not that complicated, but if you have an a and that's used to working, um, doing annuals out of the back of their hangar, throwing a major rebuild on them, uh, they may you know, like the opportunity and it's a, a lot of money that they could get, but if they're not even familiar with the insurance process, it could just add a way, an additional layer of pain to the long rebuild that you really don't want to deal with. Um, and then this is also a very key point. 
you want to make sure that the shop that you pick has the availability in their schedule to fit your plane in. And just to give everybody an idea, I mean, again, this is a, this is a point where people can chime in, but from what I've seen so far, I'm still in the middle of this rebuild. The limiting factor is um, fly combing. The time it takes, I mean, my engine was supposed to be delivered next week and they just told me it's gonna be two more weeks. And that was, so right now I'm looking at about a 32 week turnaround time. I think that's right. It's long, is it 32 weeks? Anyway, it's like, no, I got my math wrong here. Don't do algebra in public. It's a, uh, it's about a three, I'm mean at like three and a half months at this point. But the issue that can come up is if, you know, this entire time, my, my shop didn't do work for, you know, 30 days and has been taking, the, you know, a sabbatical for the past 60 days. They've been actively engaged in, you know, reworking the gear, reinstalling the stabilator, putting the wings back in, doing all the, you know, sending the engine out, sending the propeller out you know, all these different things that they're doing, it takes a lot of time. And if, if, the sh if you have a shop that says we can take your plane, but we're, we want to start working on it for 30 days. I, I mean, if you don't care about getting the plane back in a relatively timely fashion, that, that may be an option. I mean, if it's a great shop and that's what you want to do, but it definitely should be a consideration and it should be something that you think about because it's, if they delay starting to work on your plane, it is going to be a very, very long process. And it's going to be even longer too, if they're this is their first time with a Comanche. So just keep that in mind. All right, so here's my example. So I dropped a pin uh, pretty much where the field is, the, the road that, you know, those houses in the, the first picture, that's pretty much where the pin is. So you can see my insurance policy would pay to take me to the nearest airport, um, which was completely useless because Fayetteville Regional has only has an avionics shop on it. They don't have any type of uh, repair station. They have no AMPs that work on the field. Just a kind of a, a bad place to be. And this is actually, I mean, I've talked to CJ about this numerous times and we brought it up in the last Zoom, but where my plane went down is, is like a dead zone. There's just not a lot of options. So what I actually did, and I did this while I was sitting in a rental car the day after the recovery, you know, where that pin is on the map, I was on my phone and I was just had my sectional on four flight. And I was just basically doing circles around where the plane went down, calling every shop I could, calling every FBO I could, seeing if they knew any AMPs, if they knew any shops. Um, and I finally found one that, you know, the, the one that I ended up going with, got a hold of the, the AMP. This was on a Friday. You know, he was uh, great. You know, he kind of passed, uh, you know, my, my, interview, so to speak. Um, and he's uh, in the army reserve. So he gets bonus points for me from that uh, at a personal level, but he was, you know, very knowledgeable, very, very knowledgeable with the insurance process. He admitted to me, he didn't know a, uh, didn't know Comanches, you know, extremely well, expressed a willingness to learn the plane. Um, and he was even going, willing to go out to the site to, uh, you know, observe the disassembly. So his shop was over here in Wilmington. So you can see that that trip is about an hour and a half. I mean, they're probably not driving very fast with the trailer they had on. So that's probably accurate, maybe a little bit longer. So I went from 20 minutes roughly to an hour and a half. So I had an, an hour, 10 minutes to that trip. Um, and at this point, I didn't know what the quote was to go to Fayetteville. So when the quote came back to go to Fayetteville, it was $8,500 just to move the plane 20 minutes. Um, so I was a little bit nervous about what this was gonna cost. But, you know, by some grace and good fortune, the uh, adjuster came back and told me when I wanted him the plane to go to Wilmington, that the, the recovery team that I was working with happened to be going in that direction. And they said they didn't mind taking the plane the extra distance and they did it at no additional cost. So it ended up costing me nothing out of pocket, which was super awesome. In hindsight, I wish I had kind of like poked the adjust a little bit more and said, you know, see how far this will go. Like how far can I actually take this plane before you start charging me money? But I didn't, I got a good feeling from the shop. Um, and even if I picked some other shops that were maybe a little bit further away, I wasn't really in like, a, you know, not the ideal place. I mean, you, you want, I tell people you want your plane to go down and, you know, next to Matt Kirk or, you know, up by Kristen Winter or, you know, Zach or, Clifton Arrow, Heritage Arrow, but you know, that doesn't happen. And that didn't happen to me. I was kind of out in the middle of the field. 
So now let's talk about uh, expectation settings. So what's actually going to happen to your Comanche? Um, they're going to drain the fuel from your wings when they recover it, uh, which is unfortunate if you're like me and you have your mains full because you'll never see that gas again. I actually asked the my a &P, what happened to that gas? And he's like, I don't know, they took it. And I'm like, son of a gun. Um, they're going to pull the wings off the plane. They're going to pull the stabilator off the plane. They're also going to pull the rudder off the plane. They're going to hoist it onto a flatbed. And I'll show you pictures of uh, my recovery. And this is an important takeaway. There's going to be random damage you'll find over the course of the next three months, you know, all over the place. And it's, it, 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 a lot of it makes sense. Um, and I'll show you pictures. But it's just to, I say this to set your expectations. If you can influence the outcome and avoid that, you know, good on you. But that's been my experience is you're going to find some stuff that um, you didn't know was, uh, you know, you, you didn't think you're going to find. And this is, of course, assuming damage is not totaled. So an, an interesting little story here about random damage is I remember my A&P sent me a quote or sent, sent the adjuster the quote for the, the estimate for the repairs. Uh, he CC'd me on it and it had, you know, the, everything you would expect. Um, I'll share that in the rebuild one. We talk about that, but he said, uh, you know, he had the plane for about 45 days and he sends me a picture and it's a picture of you. I'll show you this one in this, in this uh, PowerPoint, but it's a picture above the handle when you climb into the plane and there's a dent, it's like the size of a baseball. And he's like, he, he's like pointing to the picture. He's like, was this here? And I was like, absolutely not. And he's like, oh, and he's like, well, we just got new lights in the shop and we're, we're seeing the plane in a you know, whole different perspective and we're finding all this, all different kinds of things now. So, I mean, that's kind of like the random thing that you don't think about is like the lighting in the shop that you're looking at. Um, so let's talk about, look at my recovery here. So you can see in this plane, this is the front. This is before they ended up pulling it back. So they had to obviously do work on the wings and they didn't want to deal with these like, it's like really hard grass, like sticks coming out. So they actually pulled the plane backwards. Um, you can see here, they have drums for the gas. They have this thing on the back called the Godzilla, which is like this really handy dandy portable uh, crane system. Um, they're using like what looks like an F-150 and an extended flatbed. Uh, so I actually got these pictures very recently. And I don't know what I had in my mind about what the uh, what they were using. I thought they were using some, like they had things in the army. So I used to be a uh, an air defense officer and they have these trucks that have these cranes that they use to lift these missile cans. I don't know, I think I had that in mind. It was this huge contraption, but it's very uh, much simpler than that, which is kind of interesting. So here you can see them, they're draining the fuel out. They pretty much used a siphon, just like a uh, you would take fuel out of a gas can. Um, it was raining. You can see in this picture, they had a little canopy over the, where they're working, which I like to see. That was, you know, from an owner perspective, that's good to see. There's a rudder they took off, a piece of the stabilator. And then this is just to show they continue working at night. You know, they just kept going. And here's another sequence. This is, in case anybody's wondering what the, uh, you know, the, the stabilator looks like and that, that, that whole setup, this is a good shot for you. Um, and then they just wrap it up like a present. And then they just put on this flatbed you can see, and then they use the Godzilla to come in and, uh, you know, pick it up so they can pull the wings off on either side. And then they hoist it up onto the back. And this is just a big foam, big, huge, chunky uh, block of foam, like hard foam. But um, yeah, and this is, uh, yeah, Pete's recording this too. So if you guys want to see these pictures later on, you guys can definitely go back if you're interested. Um, these are some issues you should expect. I say issues because it's, it's damaged, but there's also like parts that'll go missing, uh, miscellaneous stuff. Um, bolts, bushings, and other random assemblies will go missing. Just expect that and if it doesn't happen be excited that it didn't and just to give you an example um there was a bushing for a flat pulley that uh was went missing from my you know from my plane and it's probably like a, it, it's super it's like it's super small it doesn't it's not subjected to a lot of stress it's probably a two dollar part but nobody sells it because it's not worth anything and piper doesn't make it so what do they have to do? You have to custom order it. And it's like 30 bucks. Um, anyway, uh, an, an important note here is that these bushings, uh, bolts and other missing assemblies that can add a lot of money to your quote in the, in the, on the mark of thousands of dollars, which can cause your plane to get totaled, which is really, I mean, if you really love your plane, 
and even if you save it, the recovery could potentially total it, which is, it'd be super frustrating. You definitely wouldn't want that to happen. Um, so I will give you, after I go through all these issues, I'll try to tell you how to head these, these things off. You can expect damage on the wing attach points. Um, I think my team did a pretty good job. There was just a couple, like a stringer that got kind of messed up by the spar. But other than that, it was, they did a pretty good job. Um, I put this in, I mean, this list could include anything else that's kind of sticking out on the plane, antennas, you know, you name it, stuff that's just likely to get snagged on, you know, the bottom of a truck or a trailer or something like that. Um, you'll have scratches, dents from lifting and lowering the, uh, the fuselage on the crane. I'll show you a couple of dents that I had. One of them was a baseball size dent. We're pretty sure that came from a strap. I definitely didn't you know, land upside down. Um, and then you also, uh, you also see that there'll be some as assemblies that get disassembled that didn't need to. And the personal example I have is that flap assembly. The reason that that part going missing is so frustrating is because they didn't need to take that, the flap assembly apart in order to do that. And the easy way I, I as an IMP can, can tell that they didn't need to do it was because they took the flap assembly apart on one side, they didn't take it apart on the other side. So it's like, I mean, that, that's probably some inexperience with the Comanches uh, that's coming out with the shop but, or with the recovery team. Um, but there's ways to head this off. We'll talk about that. And other damage to the airframe that you'll discover as you go throughout the, uh, the rebuild process. So here's a, here's a tip. This, you can avoid a lot of this stuff by bringing your A&P who either knows or doesn't know Comanches, um, or excuse me, you bring your A&P that knows Comanches or your friend that knows Comanches. It doesn't, I don't think it has to be one or the other necessarily. As long as you have somebody on the ground there that can say, hey, whoa, 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 don't take that flap assembly apart. Not to mention the fact that you're saving the recovery team probably 30 minutes or an hour that they would have expended pulling that flap assembly apart, but you're also ensuring that your, your equipment is being protected and your, your parts are being preserved. Um, yeah, it's especially important for the recovery teams unfamiliar with the, with the type. Another thing you can do to save your, save your shop a lot of money, save a lot of uh, a, uh, time on the, 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 uh, the rebuild is bagging and tagging everything. So if you, if you have a, you know, a, a and P or a friend who's really savvy with Comanches and they can go out there and help you. And you just have like boxes and bags and you can, you can help the recovery team. And I mean, I can't speak for the recovery team, but I'm inclined to think that they would accept that help because they're getting paid from the insurance company. And it's not like you're stealing their money because you're not getting anything out of it. So if you can get the plane, help them get the plane out of there faster, so they can get on to their next job faster. Um, so definitely make the effort, bag and tag everything, and try to go out to the, the recovery with, you know, if you know the Comanche in, inside and out, you know, you go out there and do it with the recovery team or have a friend who does it or have an, you know, an A&P and those Comanches do it. Um, and another point I want to make here about the, can add thousands of dollars to the quote. So you'll see shops will add like a miscellaneous like a uh, part or like end item to a, an estimate. And that's to, to try to capture all these extra expenses that are going to be incurred by, you know, finding these parts, researching these parts, because I mean, anybody who's done this and you guys feel free to chime in. If you've had this experience, you can throw it in the chat, but you know, when my plane was delivered here, a, you know, they had all the parts and they had this, you know, all, you know, all these different assemblies kind of together. Now they have to spend time going through, you know, especially if you're, if, if you're, if your A&P is not familiar, they're going to go through, they're going to try to identify the parts based on the, you know, the parts manual, um, the service manual and try to put the plane together that way. But then if a part's missing or they can't find it, then they have to go um, investigate the part. You know, they have to double check, make sure they're not missing it. Some they're missing it somewhere where the, maybe the recovery team put it in the plane or they didn't put it on the side or who knows. But so they're spending time looking for the part. They're spending time now researching the part trying to find it somewhere in the world. Um, then they have to order the part and all of that stuff the whole time, it's just cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. And even if, you know, my experience so far has been that the shop estimated, you know, this much, but they didn't anticipate all these random things that were gonna go missing that they're gonna have to look for. So now they, the cost of the, of the uh, rebuild is going up, 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 and it's, it's getting closer to my, um, my coverage limits, but, you can avoid a lot of that, those issues 
if you bag and tag stuff, you make it easier on the shop, you know, you're kind of setting them up for success to prevent your plane from getting totaled, getting the plane rebuilt faster. Um, it's just, it, it just improves the situation. So this is something uh, I worked out with um, our friends at the Northeast Tribe, you know, CJ, Pete, and uh, some of the other folks up there is, it's, it's kind of an idea that stemmed from this, but I think it could be something that could help a lot of people if you ever find yourself, I, I hope nobody finds themselves in a situation, but unfortunately there's probably statistically going to be some folks that end up like me. Um, so one thing that I, I don't know that exists out there, but if, if anybody has experiences with recovery teams or knows people that work on recovery teams that know Comanches, please throw it in the chat, send a note to Pete uh, Pete Morris and say like, Hey, I highly recommend these people just so we can kind of get a, a running list of people that we could refer. So that way, you know, when you're down and out as an owner and you're, you're in a field somewhere and you're like, I really, you know, my adjuster is saying he needs to come get the plane, but I really want to get a, a recovery team that knows Comanches, you know, you can reach back to the Northeast tribe and they can, they can tell you, Hey, the, in the, in this area, these are the people you want to try to go with. Um, but if that doesn't work kind of the best alternative that I think would be helpful is if you had a friend. So, you know, we're all friends here. And if you have a, uh, if you are someone who would be willing to serve as like a, a representative at the recovery that could help, you know, the owner and the team bag and tag items. And it's something you're willing to be do, willing to do for someone. And maybe that person covers your cost. It's kind of like a new concept CJ and I were talking about and Pete were talking about. Please send your info to Pete. If you're like, hey, you know, I, this is something I would be willing to do for people in like this area. And that way, if you're like me, if, if you know, if I was in the same situation again, I could, I could call into, uh, you know, reach into the, the Northeast tribe and be like, hey, I need help. Who can come out and help me with this recovery? Um, it just needs to be somebody that knows Comanches inside and out and can identify what parts need to be taken, what needs to be disassembled, what doesn't need to be disassembled, and can help kind of collect the parts, you know, bag and tag, and just try to, Right, preserve the evidence, so to speak, as best as possible. So if you have any recommendations on recovery teams or you're someone who is willing to help out another owner that's kind of down on their luck, please send a note to Pete Morris. He's going to try to create a, uh, a Rolodex for you know, these two issues to, that we can all kind of reach in collectively into. And uh, it's kind of going to build the, the type support within the Northeast Comanche tribe. So just something new. Well, hopefully it works out pretty well. Um, something I wish I had available. Uh, so let's look at the specific casualties of recovery. So I had dents in the fuselage. And this next slide will be pictures after this. The fuselage from lifting straps, broken nav light reflectors, tail cone power connectors just went, uh, they went AWOL, they're missing. Flat pulley bushing was what I told you about, that was gone. Wing spar bathtub fittings went missing. Very important, important components that we had to get from a salvage yard. The wing spar attached bolts went missing. This was a huge pain in the butt to locate these bolts. If you're on the Facebook page, you probably saw me begging for help to try to figure out what the part number were, was for these because it's not listed in the parts manual. And it's kind of a, um, I was able to reach out to Hans and a bunch of other folks that were super helpful. But you know that those are the types of frustrating things that could have been avoided if I had you know, a friend or, you know, an A&P down on the ground with me, or excuse me, down with the recovery team that was uh, helping them out. There was a wing stringer that I had crushed and some skin below the stringer got cracked. So here's some examples. So you got the nav light reflector, that's broken. Uh, there's a nice dent that definitely, I mean, I guess that you could get, get that from hail, but it's kind of a, you know, weird spot that you can see there's one here and there's also one up here. Um, likely from the straps, same here, you know, another casualty of the straps. Uh, this is a nice uh, assembly that got crushed that was, um, I was interested to learn as a non a &P that the term for fixing this is called hand forming, which is the scientific term for beating this part into submission. Um, and then these were the uh, attach bolts for the spar, that attached the spar to the fuselage that I could not for the life of me figure out what the part number was. Uh, and basically had to do some uh, bolt comparison and nut comparison to the wear markings on the, uh, the assembly. So if your Comanche's totaled, um, 
I would recommend don't going to recovery or asking what happens to your plane because it's going to be very sad. Um, it's probably, it, it, it's going to be something you don't want to see, obviously. And then the horror stories include careless recovery operations. You know, everybody's seen, seen it on the, you know, some video on YouTube somewhere where a plane's being dragged off of a runway just because they want to get it out of there as quickly as possible. They're using a crane that isn't supposed to be moving planes to move planes, forklifts, I mean, you name it, just bad stuff. Reciprocating saws, getting taken to wings. Um, that's not surprisingly, that's the fastest way to get the wing off. And then, uh, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. So what kind of, this is kind of a, a fun little portion. If you have a horror story out there, you know, throw it in the chat, throw a note about it in the chat so we can talk about it. We go through the, the questions later on, but just, this is a, please share your experiences so we can all have a little, uh, you know, a, a, I shouldn't say entertainment as I guess, unless it's a different type of aircraft, like a beach or something. Um, but yeah, just share your experience. We'd be interested to see what you have to say. Um, all right, so for the delivery, this is what's generally what's gonna happen. Your plane's gonna be hoisted off of the truck, your wings and stabilator will be left with the plane. You'll get a pile of unassorted parts if you don't affect the outcome from the beginning. Um, and then your A&P will be left to put all the pieces together. And I say that because that's really what's gonna happen. Um, they're just gonna be you know, putting it back together like a Lego, very sophisticated Lego. So here's my delivery. You can see that there is, uh, this is a fuselage. This is a kind of a weird way to look at a plane. I think it looks like a torpedo or something like a submarine, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you can see the wings are down here on the side. They're on foam, foam board as well. Um, this is just a different angle. And uh, you can see here, I think the most important thing here is the fuel that I never saw again. Uh, this is the uh, Godzilla working in uh, lowering the, the plane back down onto the, uh, the foam cord box. Um, so this is my little AR, what, what I think went well and just kind of reflecting on the experience. So you got a recovery team that had some experience with Comanches and that was not by any of my doing, that was just by luck. And I feel very grateful that they had the experience they did because, you know, I, like I said, I was gonna complain about what happened to my plane just cause, you know, it's, it, did, it wasn't like that when I left it, but you know, all things considered, they did a pretty good job. Um, I think they did a pretty good job with the shop selection. I've been very pleased with them so far. Uh, one thing I did was I selected the shop pretty quickly. Um, you know, I was doing this on a, like a Friday afternoon, scrolling through my phone, you know, in the, in the middle of nowhere, where I was even struggling to get cell service. Like, it was just a terrible experience. Um, but, I, you know, identifying that shop quickly is, is key because that kind of gets, is another thing you have to check off the list for moving the aircraft. Um, in my, in the modern aviation the shop that I'm taking it to in Wilmington, the, the director of maintenance is very upfront. He told me, he's like, I'm a beach shop. He's like, I work on, you know, a lot of King Airs and a lot of Bonanzas, but he's like, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm willing to learn the Comanche. And he's like, I haven't worked on one before. Um, and, you know, nobody really wants an AMP to learn on their plane. Uh, but this is one of those situations where it's really a unique opportunity for any NP just because the plane is literally in pieces and they're putting it together um, in a kind of going through the growing pains of struggling through putting a plane together when a service manual you know, for the, the Comanche is not the most helpful ever. In the example that I will give is a uh, like the teaser for the rebuild is that the the Comanche's wings are at a five degree dihedral and you have to put them in at the same time because they connect in the middle. It's a unique uh, part of the Comanche, but it's one of the things that makes the spar incredibly strong. Um, but it sounds really easy, right? But the service manual just says insert wings. And it's like, you know, how do I get the wings up to the point where I can insert them at the perfect angle? Um, I'll talk about that at the next, uh, the next Zoom. And I have some pictures of what that looked like. But that's the kind of thing that they were willing to work through, willing to struggle with. And they're definitely more knowledgeable now that, they've, now that they've done it. They've been willing to accept all the resources and help provided. So I think one of the things that, one of the questions you really need to be frank with your, uh, your shop, if, especially if they're not a Comanche shop, is you need to ask them, you know, are you willing to, if you're not a Comanche shop, are you willing to, you know, accept anything, you know, if somebody else comes in the shop, would, you, would that offend you? Would that bother you? That somebody's looking over your stuff? And you know, the director of maintenance here at Modern Aviation, he said, told me from the very beginning, he's like, absolutely not. He's like, if you can send somebody in here to look at my stuff, if you can send me installation manuals for the conduits, it's a good example. He's like, we welcome any help we can get. He's like, cause we just want to learn, we want to learn the aircraft and give it to you 
in, uh, in perfect condition. Another benefit, this was a, uh, another consideration. I, I would say, I should have probably should have put this in selecting your shop, um, but the shop that I picked had a really strong working relationship with a Lycoming engine distributor in a, an engine shop, which is, I think it's up in Burlington, North Carolina, but uh, a triad aviation. I don't know if anyone in here is familiar with it, but um, there's a, a gentleman up there named uh, Othman and he is like a Lycoming engine expert in, I had all kinds of questions. I peppered, you know, I was, I was peppering my director of maintenance, Chris at Modern Aviation. And he just said, he, he sent me uh, Othman's number and he's like, just call Othman. He'll answer all your questions. And Othman was great. You, you know, he advised me on what I should uh, do with the engine, you know, rebuild, factory rebuild. Um, and it, it just made the process very easy. I didn't have to go seek out an engine shop. And not to mention the fact that um, Othman works with Chris on a regular basis. So they, they share experiences, they share knowledge. So that's also beneficial. I, I like knowing that as an owner. And I think that's uh, another benefit of modern aviation. They give me regular updates, probably weekly or every other week, I get pictures about the progress, things they're doing. Um, they just took the engine mount off. I, I saw a picture of that. Uh, and they have a lot of experience working with the insurance company. They know the song and dance, they understand how it works and they're not really making me do anything because it's kind of a weird process. I won't get into it too much because it's it's the it will be covered in the insurance zoom, but when you're the owner, in the shop is basically updating their quotes and everything like that and communicating with the adjuster. You're CC on all these emails and you'll randomly get something from the adjuster saying, "Hey, I need you to approve this," and you you're just like, "Okay, yes or no." So you're just you you're the approval authority in the middle, but you're not really. Um, too heavily involved, as long as everything is going well. Now, some experiences, again, may differ, but that was mine. Uh, and another thing that was helpful that is my director of maintenance went out to observe part of the disassembly. So he did have an understanding of the different components and, and how they went together. He wasn't, uh, and he he's admitted to me, he's confessed to me that he regrets not bringing one of the, one of his team members out to, you know, kind of be on the ground there and you know, with the recovery team looking at everything inside and out. He said, Could he, that's something he regrets and something he will, it, knowledge he will take going forward to not make the same mistake again. And then another thing, this is just good business practice. You can pick this up pretty early just from working with a shop. You know, the stuff they tell you, you can tell if they're cutting corners um, or giving you good advice. And I've had some bad experiences with uh, some shops, um, but this I, this has been a much po more positive experience than I've had with uh I think I've had, I've, I've owned an aircraft, I've owned the Comanche for a year and I think this is the third shop I've worked with and this is the, the best experience I've had of the three. Um, so what could I have done better? I, I should have provided a list of a couple of shops. I, I wish I had known and I impart that knowledge onto all of you. So when you are looking at your options, I, I would say don't settle for the first shop that you, um, that you identify as a, a viable option. Try to find, I would say two or three that are pretty good options. I mean, if you're, if you put your plane down next to a, you know, in Florida next to Matt Kirk, I mean, that's kind of a no brainer, but um, if you're not in that situation, then definitely get a couple options and run them by the adjuster to see what he says. I wish I had uh, reached out to the Northeast tribe to get a shop referral. That's something that everybody here can do. Um, but that was, you know, kind of a blind spot of mine, and and it, it's hard. Admittedly, admittedly, it's it's kind of difficult because you're you're still kind of recovering from the adrenaline, you know, the post traumatic stress of like, you know, having an in flight emergency, putting a plane down in a field, a plane down in a field, and walking away away from it, and now you're being inundated with all this information and all these questions from like the insurance company, the FAA, the shops. It's just it's a lot of process. I mean. You're not thinking probably as clearly as you'd like to be, um, but I, hopefully this presentation arms uh, all of you with knowledge to help you navigate this process a little bit. I wish I could have been physically present during recovery. Um, some of my other uh, military folks out there know that the army is not, well, the military in general is not super, uh, not very quick. It's a bureaucracy at, at approving time off. And, you know, the recovery was on Monday and you know, I was putting everything together on Friday. So there's no way I was gonna be able to be there just wasn't really a viable option, but I really wish I'd been there. And I would encourage anybody who can be at the recovery to be at the recovery and bring your friend. Uh, your A&P 
your Comanche A and P or your friend who just knows A and P's or knows uh, Comanches inside and out. Um, so with regard to the reassembly, that is not part of this presentation. So that's my teaser for the next one, uh, but stay tuned. I'll go through all the, the decisions I had to make, the, the, the things you think about, the different, all the different considerations that you have to go, that'll go through your mind and you know, recommendations and uh, you know, things of that sort. But that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, um, please, uh, please you, you can text me, you can call me. Um, I, I'll do my best to give you as much consult as I can about you know, the process inside and out. Um, but yeah, that's all I have. Uh, you know, CJ, I guess I'll turn it back over to you or Pete. We have to find that unmute button. Will, amazing. <laughs> Let me pop into the chat window. Thanks a, a lot. Um, the, uh, I have a bunch of photos that were sent to me before by somebody who couldn't be here, but had built a trailer with jigs um, to, to hold the wings at the correct uh, dihedral and who offered to help anybody who needed to uh, remove an airplane because those are things that you don't always think about and having those wings at just the right angle so that you can put them back on ends up being critical. I'm going to give you one uh, experience and that is to be very uh, weary of municipal assistance and recoveries. In particular, a Comanche that went down within a uh, half mile of an airport and the fire department came with a device. I don't know what it is. It was powered by a chainsaw engine. And to remove the airplane, which was very minorly damaged, they cut the wings off with this big round grinding wheel. And that was the end of that airplane. The municipality fire department uh, took it from a minorly damaged airplane to a total wreck. Yeah. George is right, and that a, is from a legal perspective. There's not much recourse you have against municipalities, too. So I guess to the extent there's no recourse, there's not much. There's none. You're done. Yeah. And that brings up your point of have somebody that knows something about airplanes do the recovery. Uh, it was not in a precarious position. They they the fire department just came up and chopped the wings off and carried it off. It was not badly damaged until then. Can you stop them from doing that? I don't know. Hmm. I, I, don't know. I mean, it's... I guess I don't really want to stand in front of the chainsaw armed fireman, but still. So uh, there were two people in the airplane and uh, nobody was injured. We just opened the door, walked out. The airplane wasn't badly damaged. It didn't have any leaking fluids because there were no fluids in it. I won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But uh, yeah, the, the fire department took care of uh, any chance of recouping any uh, usability for that Comanche 400. That was done. It was total. Oh, it was a 400. Oh, yeah. Do you remember which one? No, I don't want to remember. <laughs> oh. yeah. no, you know, um... I'm, um, I'm on a couple of municipal committees and boards and, um, you know, everybody's correct if a municipality is is determined to do something there is in my end my understanding is there's not a lot of reports but there may be some negotiation room if you can negotiate quickly the main interest is typically uh, safety and to clear a runway that you're blocking one so um, this is part of why the knowledge being delivered tonight is so crucial um, Zach Grant had uh, some time ago said to me that a lot of Comanches end up totaled when somebody just goes and, you know, comes out with the local tractor that's used to drag the lawnmower and just basically picks it up and moves it because if it's not lifted properly, it'll, it'll do tremendous damage to the aircraft. So Will's lifting crew, um, even though they created some dents on, on, you know, the fact that they, they had some familiarity with with being an actual recovery team was enormously helpful. I had a uh, I had an incident similar to what George experienced. It wasn't with an aircraft. It was with an, a gate to the dock, to my dock that's on a river. And in a rescue operation, the Coast Guard decided they needed to take a, a 
jaws of life to the gate so they could get into my dock <laughs> to perform the operation. And uh, I tried to track it down and get somebody to come out and repair the gate. But I mean, it was like, I guess that was my community service for the, for the, the next 10 years fixing my gate. So yeah, you really do have to watch them. And I, I don't think there's a whole lot of understanding of that, that airplanes are strong in flight, but when they're on the ground, they're as delicate as little birds. And you, you know, <laughs> it's a, yep. it's a conundrum really. It really is. So well said. I appreciate your story, George. Well said, yeah. sir. Yeah. I'm going to pop into the chat window for a moment. Um, there was a question about, um, so just the thing, so Rob Whiteley, who was just speaking, posted, make sure you take pictures of the fuel gauges and or document the fuel level before you defuel the, the airplane. Um, not, and then uh, Malcolm added, take pictures of everything, the radios, every inch of the exterior seats, et cetera. Uh, and those are- mm -hmm. CJ, I can, uh, to supplement Malcolm's recommendation, one thing I did when I was at the plane is I, I didn't include it in the other presentation because it was really long, but I took a video going like all the way around the plane, get it, trying to get everything I could, especially with iPhones nowadays, you can like pull frames out of the iPhone. So it's, it's an easy way to capture tons of information and like kind of a, a quick you know review of it. But I completely agree with Malcolm's assessment. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Just wanna, um, Mark Sullivan had some great advice. Uh, he posted, that he had his first and last engine failure departing Wheeler Army Air Force Base on Oahu in a brand new Cessna Aerobat owned by an Air Force flying club. The plane had less than 10 hours on the Hobbs and he had 55 hours total pilot time on a brand new private pilot's license and have been told, never try to turn back to the airport. But when all you have is rocks and trees ahead of you, that advice is immediately forgotten. And as he turned to the engine, started spurting out bursts of power, cleared the chain link fence by about 10 feet and landed on the grass at the departure end of the airport. The engine had swallowed a valve, but the remaining three cylinders gave just enough power to make it back. The lesson learned, even a new engine maintained by scrupulous Air Force mechanics can bite you. I plan for an engine failure with every takeoff. It's great advice, and this goes back to the CFI session we had a few weeks ago, where the thing that came out that a lot of us don't do is that pre-flight briefing and that assessment of the terrain that you're going to be departing from. Well, well, this is not applicable to your situation where you ended up having a rod go through your engine. Um, that idea that before you take off, you're always gonna assess the terrain and, and determine what your options are comes again. Um, DJ, may I say something? Yeah. For a second? Please. Up in uh, Northern California, where I live, um, we just had a Mooney uh, uh, incident where a guy took off from the Palo Alto airport, and it's a pretty, pretty urban environment, or I would say suburban environment, and uh, he managed to put it on the freeway safely. Unfortunately, he hit a car, he kind of spun into the guardrail, but they all walked away. And um, I was really thrilled to see that. And uh, I have a picture of it if, if you want me to share my screen, but uh, they, were, they were very fortunate. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, did everything just right. And uh, when they interviewed the pilots, they kind of went, or went through the same deals. Like we always kind of look around and, and have a plan. And uh, it's not a very attractive, uh, proposition in that particular airport. I used to fly in and out of it a lot. There's, there's not, you know, it's not like farmland. It's not flat or anything, but uh, yep, the airplane was damaged and uh, everybody walked away and all they did, I think some Toyota hit it or something, but everybody was out there just talking about it after the incident. So that was a happy ending. That happened yesterday out here. Mm. <laughs> yep. Um, so Jim asked, uh, and this is a question in general, isn't there an A&P on the recovery team? I, I don't know the answer to that, CJ. I'm, I couldn't say. I'm not sure. I don't think it's is required. Any, yeah. I, I mean, you might right. get lucky, but I, I wouldn't count on it. 
I just find yeah. it amazing that they'd be pulling wings and tails off an airplane, but it's not somebody who's an A&P that would do it. Well, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think that it might be a good idea, and I don't know if anybody, you know, wants to take this on as a project, but there's probably some strap points and lift points that are pretty strong in the structure of the Comanche that um, maybe we could actually, you know, put our heads together and figure out, okay, in the event you have to recover one, this is the recommended areas where you can put a, a, a strap across the fuselage or or this is the recommended technique to remove the wings, whatever. It's, it's it, just, I, I know that there's nothing, I have never seen any documentation on aircraft specific recovery. Maybe the military has it or something, but that'd be an interesting little project. Would it be worth even having a little decal or something saying strap here? <laughs> little arrow or something like that. That's a little pessimistic, Adam. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but you're right, just to have, uh, so you probably, you may, have, you may have or may not have heard of the Comanche Docs Online project. Um, Northeast is a mirror site, so if you go to docs.northeastcomanche.org, and that's just D-O-C-S, all of the uh, manuals, the parts manuals, the service manuals, the ADs, um, a bunch of the original POHs, the original brochures are all there. Um, and an a &P just texted me and said he's going to look up and see whether the lifting uh, uh, recommendations are in the, in the book. So we should have an answer pretty quickly. Um, thank you, Scott. Um, the, uh, so, but the, that, um, it'd be great to pull that out and put it as a separate document into the online library on Comanche everything. Um, and I know Matthew Aaron Smith, who is heading that project, will be happy to do that. So um, let's see. Pete, do you have the ability to just grab that recommendation? Because I think we can follow up and get that done pretty quickly. And, uh, and thank you for suggesting it. I'm just sticking a note, or actually, um, Adam, would you be willing to post into the window since I'm gonna lose where I'm at in the Zoom if I do it, uh, get a page on where to lift and add it to the, the library? Do you want me to just type in that? Yes, those just type it list? right into the chat okay. window and it becomes a reminder of uh, like a to-do, <laughs> to-do, colon. CJ, to-do. <laughs> oh, great, give it to me, thanks. <laughs> um, and then uh, Andy had a great question. Recommend retaining an aviation attorney for this process. Would that be worthwhile? I, I would say, I mean, at the risk of sounding a lot like a lawyer, it, it depends. Um, it depends on the, like your own situation. And I mean, if, if anybody here wants to, I mean, you have my phone number now. It's, it's been out in two Zooms. If you, if you happen to be in a situation where you think you might need an aviation attorney, um, I, I can't give anybody legal advice because uh, the army doesn't let me do that, but I can at least tell you whether or not I think you should get an attorney. Um, my situation didn't really call for it. There was nobody that was injured. There was no property. Nobody was really fighting over anything. And I mean, my insurance company is, is there for that purpose. And one of the things that you get with insurance cover coverage generally is they're going to pay your attorney's fees. So you're usually not coming out of pocket uh, with regards to like, damage, I mean, and this is kind of like going to the emergency, but like any property damage or any uh, personal injury damage that you cause, because the insurance company is there for that. Um, I wouldn't, rec I, I don't think I'd recommend getting an aviation attorney unless you get into, I'm, I mean, I'm trying, I'm like racking my brain here. The only time I would probably engage an attorney in my situation would be if I was in a dispute with my shop over work that I was paying for. Um, and it would have to be a pretty serious dispute, obviously. Uh, but even, even the, the, like the insurance stuff, the, the sh stuff that the insurance company is paying for, that's not affecting me at all. I mean, that's a battle the insurance company would have with the shop. So I'd say generally the answer would be no, you wouldn't need an aviation attorney or, um, I mean, if you're, Pardon the expression, but if you're riding dirty and you don't have insurance, and then you cause all kinds of property damage, 
you're going to want to engage an attorney yes. probably immediately. Um, but I think most of us probably fly insured and you, you really wouldn't need one because your insurance is going to cover. You wouldn't need one initially. Now, if you start busting your policy limits, that's a different question. Um, that's a whole different issue. But generally, I think starting off, you wouldn't need an attorney. I was curious, Will, if I may ask a question at this juncture. When you when you reported this to your insurance company, did, did they do any kind of uh, log but inspections or examination regarding your recency of currency and so forth and so on? That's a great question, Rob, for the next Zoom. Oh, and done, done. <laughs> insurance Zoom. Uh, He's building that cliffhanger hook in Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a brief answer. I'll give you what, yes. And that's what I'll leave it at. And I'll, I'll go in more detail later. Mm. Um, just another piece of feedback that Will's got a great idea and that would be a great, a, a great aspect and a great benefit to the Comanche community, a database of not only recovery teams, but also good A&P shops, prop shops, paint shops, avionics shops. Uh, those questions come up all the time. And so, um, yes, it is a big task, but one that we're working on. In fact, there's some pretty interesting discussions going on back channel right now on uh, top A and P shops. Um, so stay if, tuned. If, um, William, if you have an off airport landing, but you feel the aircraft is pretty much unharmed, can you choose to not claim with the insurance company at all and just the take the damage and pay for it yourself to prevent the risk of it being ripped off, um, not ripped off, uh, written off or anything like that. You could. Because yeah. oftentimes you can, uh, insurance companies will go, that's right off. And you're sitting there going, it's a perfectly airworthy airplane, you know. No, you, you absolutely could. You don't have to, nothing requires you to file an insurance claim. Um, yet, I mean, you just, things you have to think about is, is, are that you're going to move the plane. So, I mean, in my case, that was $8,500. Um, but then I also have to pay to reassemble the plane. And mm. that that's the that's the big ticket price. That is a very expensive endeavor. And the engine. Yeah, not well, yeah, not to mention the engine. I mean, when we talk about the rebuild, I will address the cost of this stuff, but I mean the cost of the what the insurance is going to pay combined with what I am going to pay just to put the plane back in the air are is pushing six figures. It's, it's not mm. expensive. It, it's just, it's the insurance company is paying for a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. The, so, the, re the reason I ask is as a 20 year old flying some pretty heavy, high end machinery, if I make a claim, then I'm probably not going to be invited to come back the next year, <laughs> you know? Um, so it always concerns me of my, that insurance price going skyrocketing if we have an incident in the 400 or anything like that. Yeah. I'll, I'll share my experience about that. Uh, because uh, another another teaser, my so my incident happened November fifth, and my policy expired uh, December twelfth. So you want to talk about timing? It's really bad timing. Um, mm. And I'll I'll explain how that worked out at the next one. Ah, oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, from Pat, what was done with regard to the dents caused by straps? So I, I, I'd have to defer to the A&P on that. I know he is working them out. I, I don't know what that entails. I'm not a A&P, um, but the insurance company is paying for the labor for that to be done. And obviously mm -hmm. they're going to be paying for paint for all kinds of stuff. So like the, uh, um, the plane we had, I mean, I had a pretty good paint job when even after it ran, you know, even it, when it was in the field when I left it, it was still in pretty good shape. So they're, they're, they're going to pay for the labor on all that, but the specifics on how he's, I mean, if there's an AP in here that knows how to pull dents out or get dents out, maybe you go in on the inside and you push it out or you pull it out. There's, I, I'm not an AP, but. there's a little tool you can get. I'm not sure if it can be used on aircraft, but I know it's used a lot in cars. There's a little tab you uh, you attach and you pull from the top. And it's like you attach a row of tabs along the entire dent and use that. I'm wondering if any AMPs can answer if that is the one you use on a plane as well. No? Okay, James is shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the on non-control surfaces, believe it or not, uh, Bondo is allowed <laughs> and then paint, but I don't know the answer. Um, so from, from uh, Scott Morris, uh, you mentioned having a hard time finding the nuts and bolts. 
Uh, did you find a good source or find the part number? One thing that's invaluable is having a resource for the hardware. So for the- Webco. <laughs> yeah, first off, like Webco gets a big shout out. I, I feel like I've been annoying them a lot because I'm always asking them questions about like, what is this part number? What's like, how do I get this? Um, the, the, you know, the parts manual is like the first stop, obviously, it, but there are some parts in the parts manual that are not numbered. Um, so what I, what I ended up doing for a lot of these things was, and this is, this is me helping my mechanic out. I, I mean, there are a lot of owners of other aircraft. I don't know. We'll call them bonanzas that wouldn't really be that, um, involved in you know the process you know we we all love our planes and i always i told chris my you know the guy who's the director of maintenance from the get-go i was like if you ever have any issues finding parts or um you know you run into an issue identifying something please let me know and i will do everything i can to figure out what it is and yeah you know the, that's not i mean it's not money coming out, out of my pocket because the insurance company is putting the bill here but what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to protect the estimate as best i can because I don't want the estimate to bump into my plan. And I don't know what happens in that situation. And if somebody does, it, it's probably going to be a, a, a conversation with the, the carrier where they tell me they're not going to pay over a certain amount. Um, but to go back to the original question of sourcing the parts, I've relied heavily on uh, Webco. Um, I found I mean, I've called uh, Clifton Arrow with a couple couple of questions. I think for those specific uh, spar, like fuselage spar attach bolts, um, those are the most difficult by far to find because the part number is not in the manual. And we kind of had to fall back to um, looking at the grip length, looking at the diameter of the hole, trying to match the bolts. Uh, and it's not a super high stress. I mean, uh, some of the bolts in the spar are like, very high stress. These ones are not. Um, but they're still part of the spar, so I still wanted to get as close as possible, obviously. So I, I basically pinged probably, I'm trying to think, four or five people. Um, I actually even pushed a, uh, a query into the ICS website to ask. I mean, I was just kind of desperate, like Googling, like, how do I find this stuff? And, uh, and I actually got heard back from somebody and they said, contact, you know, Philip at Webco. So, you know, took me back to Webco. Um, but I would say Webco is kind of the first stop. And then they actually have, uh, John told me this when I talked to them, they have, they pay for a subscription to some service where if they don't have a part, they can look up the part number and figure out who might or where to look. Um, so with the bushings, for example, for the flap, he told me, he's like, yeah, you're gonna have to look in a salvage yard. So I started calling salvage yards. And of course it's, it's such a cheap part. No, no uh, unless I wanna buy an entire wing I mean, I'm not going to get that, that little tiny bushing. So I had to have a, uh, I think I went to, Chris and Winter recommended McAllister car and I went online and ordered the part there. Um, but a lot of the other, a lot of the other bolts and stuff, if you can figure out what they are, a lot of shops, uh, at least, you know, Chris, for example, at Modern Aviation, he has a lot of those bolts on the shelf that he, he didn't have to order them or anything like that. Um, Another good recommendation, I just thought of this too, is as soon as they get the plane in the shop, they should start ordering the parts for it. So, I mean, they can go in the manual and, and they're generally not gonna, they're not gonna use the same bolts again if they can. I mean, why would you use a 65 year old bolt when you can order the same thing? I mean, granted, yeah, it's been doing its job for 65 years, but if you can, you know, replace them with new stuff, I think that makes people generally feel more comfortable, but it's just a good, it's a good practice. As soon as the plane goes in the shop, that the A and P should be on it and just start ordering all of these parts. So that way they're not waiting for them and ordering them as they, they think of them. Um, but the issues come up when they think they have a part that they expected there to, you know, to be there and that it's, it's not there and they can't find the part number. The only part number we couldn't find the whole time was that those um, so far were those, those bolts that go into the, those bathtub fittings in the fuselage. And I have it, I think I put it out in the Facebook group. So if you're like, man, my wing came off and I lost those bolts, like where do I find them? It, it, I post on the Facebook page for it to be stored in the Facebook archives for eternity. Um, so nobody has to go through my same struggle again, but hopefully that answers your question. Oh, unfortunately the Facebook archives are difficult to access, but we'll capture the info. 
Um, it's one of the concerns about the Facebook group moderators, actually, is that Facebook was not really well designed to be uh, archival, but we're starting to try to get organized about punting stuff over to Matthew Smith. Gotcha. You can email me too, and I'll give it to you. I'll tell you what it is. Beautiful. Yep. Um, so I've heard back from the ANP who was looking for the uh, whether there were Comanche lift point guidelines, and he said not easy to find, not found yet. Um, Zach, I do want to do just one thing. Zach Grant had mentioned to me, and this just popped into my head, that although this wouldn't have helped Will stuck in a field, in a bean field, if you have a Comanche that has end up in either a gear collapse or a gear up situation, and you can get three or four strong people to link arms underneath the fuselage and lift, you actually can lift and move a Comanche off the runway and that will save the, you know, the, the nightmare stories of, of hacksaws and uh, sawzalls and tractors coming in and just, you know, shoving it off. So the thing that everybody should now have stuck in their mind is the picture of, you know, like four strong people with arms linked or six strong people with arms linked underneath a Comanche literally lifting the airplane to get it off of a runway without damaging it further. You know, CJ, one thing that that brings to mind, and I think Adam, Adam asked the question, I saw it pop up, is that is that going to break people's backs? Maybe. But the um, one thing I, I was thinking of when you were describing that was, you know, when you move a refrigerator, you get usually two, you know, burly men that put these straps over their shoulders. And I, I think you could probably put those under the fuselage and that way you, you could maybe get it done with four people or six people. Um, but that would be, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you run the risk of the lift points again, but at the same point, it's, I mean, I can't imagine that those straps going underneath the fuselage like that with enough people is gonna do much more damage than six people putting their arms together. But. Yes, uh, well, exactly. Greg Peel, who was talking to a recovery company um, is in the, in the middle of a restoration project. He went up with a friend, disassembled and crated and carried a Comanche 250 from Turner's Falls, Massachusetts to Zephyr Hills, Florida. And the trick there ended up, he built um, a, a cradle for it. And the recovery company said, use thick shag carpet or just thick carpet uh, in the cradle. And he said that the airplane made it to uh, Florida without a single dent. So for those that are, you know, that are here that can pass along the information. It looks like looks like carpet is actually helpful as part of the the, the way to distribute the load. Um, we'll try to since this is really turning out to be an acute point of question. Maybe we can we can try to pull together recommendations from the community and then just quickly talk about it next week if we can find anything. Well, I I, I just I just wanted to make a one comment about nuts and bolts and stuff. And, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a licensed mechanic, but I've done a lot of mechanical work and a lot of stuff. And when you, when you replace bolts, make sure that if the bolt has a torque spe spec, uh, you don't replace it, you, you get a new one. And, it, it, it and with the associated hardware, uh, it's, it's okay to do that in a car, you know, or your dune buggy or whatever, but um, A, most, a lot of times uh, bolts have been replaced and they have not been torqued to spec or they've been over torqued over the history of the airplane. Or um, if, if, if the, the bolt has been in there for a long time, how you torque a bolt is you actually stretch the shank of the bolt and that's what makes your torque wrench click. So between the, the torque setting and years and years of, of stress caused by, you know, the wings flexing or whatever, if it's something that is an airworthiness issue, like those, you know, all that big bolt array you have at the V where the, where the, where the main spars come in and stuff, get new bolts. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if you go by the Piper part number, the Piper part number is the Piper part number. There's a number behind that because I know for a fact that Piper Aircraft Company does not manufacture a bolt for that. <laughs> so they bought it from someone and it takes a little bit of uh, uh, persistence, but you can find the spec for the bolt 
but it's pretty hard to, you, you got to really drill down to get it. So I just wanted to throw that in there that uh, um, torquing critical bolts and things. Um, I've done some work on some rail cars and stuff, you know, and, and uh, yeah, it's, you can get away with it once, but maybe you, you with these older airplanes, you don't have a history really of, of that kind of stuff. So uh, just to reiterate what I said, if it's a if it's a airworthiness uh, 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 item on your on your spars or on any other critical assemblies, and it's a bolt with a torque spec, the fact that it has a published torque spec means it's a critical part that's going to be stressed in flight or whatever. If you can, if if you're if you lose it and you're forced to replace it, don't go down to the junkyard and get one. You know because it's already, it's tired. It wants to retire. So I just want mm. to clarify that because we mentioned, you know, saving the parts and everything and putting them back in. Make sure your mechanics understand that too, because um, uh, it, it's uh, torquing of, of fasteners is quite a science and it's not really in, understood in depth by a lot of guys that do it. And uh, that's just my two cents worth on that. Yeah, I think I'll throw something in on that too. Uh, having been in building my own race cars and and been involved in maintenance of military aircraft as a civilian, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mostly Mach One, and uh, at, it's arbitrary about anything that's a structural piece of hardware when you take it apart, throw it away and get a new one. And when I do, I do all my own work on my own Comanche and I did on, I've done that on all of my planes and then get it signed off. But I just as soon spend an extra hundred or two hundred dollars on an annual with new hardware that's structural. And uh, it's pretty obvious what's structural. Throw it away, buy something new. And it's never failed me yet, both on race cars, racing engines or airplanes. This is it's good info yeah. that I had never heard. Yeah, thanks, Rich. Thanks for backing me up, Rich. <laughs> uh, um, don't forget, I'm jump don't forget oh, when good. it's an airplane or a fast car, you know whose two cheeks are sitting in it when it goes to hell in a hand. <laughs> there you go. Um, I'm going to jump forward just because this is on topic. Um, Pete, can you enable Paul Licata to screen share? He said he's got a picture of lifting. And also his setup for uh, setting dihedral because he also just had to put the wings back on his airplane. Yeah. Screen share is, is available. Go ahead. All right. Let me see if I can do this. Hit the green button, click on what you want to show, and hit the other button. Nice job, Paul. Good on you. Right. There you go. So those are the two points that I used to, to lift my Comanche when I pulled it off the, the, the trailer. And those are really the only two stations you can lift from, and you have to have the spreader bars. If you don't have the spreader bars, you'll oil can the, the fuselage, and that's probably what happened to Will's when they lifted it, because they didn't have spreader bars, at least in the pictures that he showed. Um, and you have to be really, really careful. Oh, this is great. Do you have a close up of that, Paul? Or can you zoom on your screen? We can zoom on ours, but I don't, I think we'll get better resolution if you zoom on yours. So the, The aft lift point is through where the spar connects, and then the forward lift point is right under, uh, just to the rear of where the gear retracts to. This is really, really helpful. Yeah, that's that's perfect. So, like vicinity of the firewall, and then obviously the center section of the airplane where the uh, main spars intersect that's that's great thank you yeah this, this is awesome because this is a perfect example of how your comanche friends can come in and save the day by seeing what they were doing to my comanche and being like no 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 no, no don't do that don't do that
Yeah. And then let me see if I can find a picture of putting the wings back on. Yeah, the Comanche wing spar is ridiculously strong setup, but it does require you come right in from both sides with the right dihedral so you can bolt them together. Did the picture switch to the Comanche in the hangar? Not yet. You may have to end this share and then reshare. Yep. Nice job. So that, that's how I put my wings back on. I, I built these two tables and they're four point adjustable uh, with threaded rod to set the dihedral and the height. It, it's a project to get those wings lined back up. Brilliant. Um, you know, Paul, if we can add yours and then um, I know of a couple of other pilots doing restorations that have built different types of jigs and I actually, uh, a little bit later after we're done with the chat, we can come back and I can screen share one of the ones that I was sent. Very, very similar approach. Um, some may be more portable than others, but I think many people are willing to make these available because once you're done putting your wings back on your Comanche, most people aren't expecting to have to do it again for a good long time. <laughs> I, sh I sure don't plan on it. <laughs> So aspects of yours might be able to be uh, disassembled and sent over to prevent a shop from having to build another one. I don't know. What, how long did it take you to build yours and what were the material I, I, costs? I built them in about a day. Yeah. For, so not bad. With stuff I had laying around the shop. Cool. Maybe it's just putting together a set of directions. Yep, absolutely. Good. Hey, all righty. Paul, I just want to um, say, uh, this is uh, Josh. I just want to say, I've, I've, I watched your airplane for 20 years and uh, I, I knew the guy that owned it who uh, would come over every Saturday morning and start it and just sit in it for 20 minutes, run the engine. And uh, I happened to pass you. I was on the way to the airport when you were leaving Turner's Falls with that plane. It was really fun to see it go. And I, I think it's fantastic that you're going to get it, get it going again. Good for you. Yeah, that my airplane was in Bowling Green, Kentucky. That's where I got mine. Yep. Oh, okay. okay. Right. But you know what? It's Greg Peels, who, Greg. who's in Turner Falls. And uh, he will be, he's going to be one of the people that will be, um, we're, we're actually polling. We have some amazing restorations and we know we're not finding all of the right ones, but I've asked Greg to be one of the people um, that comes in because he's documented a lot of the work he's been doing when we do our Comanche Zoom on restoration. And I have a feeling that one's going to be a multi-part because there's amazing stories and information that came out of those restorations that I think will be helpful for maintenance for all of us. So it is beautiful. Um, and uh, I'm so happy, Josh, that you're going to be able to see it in its new condition. Yeah, that's great. So many people work so hard to preserve these airplanes. And then when we as younger, newer pilots get to, you know, sort of adopt them <laughs> and, uh, and become the new uh, caretaker, it's an incredible experience to find out what happened before. So connecting those stories of before with those of us who have them later is I think just a real service. Um, the, uh, let's see. So it looks like we're on, on a roll to getting, uh, information on how to, how to get, get them off. Um, the, there was somebody else, was there somebody else who was also offering to screen share something useful? Okay. I think it was Paul's. Um, so a question from Russ was recovery to a suitable nearby airport by heavy lift helicopter considered? 
Uh, it, it was not. It wasn't even brought up by the insurance company. I, I think the cost of that is pretty significant. I mean, I, I can tell you from um, my experience, I mean, it's, it's not exactly the same, but I do some of the legal reviews for use of military aircraft, and I know how much helicopters are to operate, and I, I don't think that would have been a, a viable option. I think that would have kind of broke the bank for my um, – my insurance company and they probably would have said no way yeah interesting question though because it does skip the restore yeah um so bill kniff posted and and i can confirm like this is a great idea he suggest he said i suggest you have a box of quart-sized plastic bags and a marking pen stored in the plane for handling movable parts it has come in very handy a few times and i can concur i carry a quart size and a gallon size box of uh, plastic bags and a marking pen. And uh, Josh Simpson, who was just speaking, mentioned that uh, Will mentioned bringing a friend or an A&P if possible, but even a Comanche fan who can keep a cool head can assist with bagging parts and labeling, uh, watch for parts falling, et cetera. That would be valuable company. So I think maybe we could have folks sign up to be uh, recovery buddies and be clear about what expertise they can bring. Uh, Josh, that's great. So that's I think that that was actually Katie's suggestion, but she also made everybody cookies while we were on this chat. So all of you are welcome <laughs> to come over for some. Oh, yes. Okay, we'll be over directly. Can, can you email feedback. me some of those cookies, please? Can you email them over here? Yeah, we'll put them right over. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Not yeah, that far there's away, something so about virtual plastic. I'll, I'll go with my tea here. Oh, oh okay. nice mug. Yes. Virtual cookies, they're just not the same. Um, Bill Kniff, do you want to just quickly discuss the, uh, this, is, this has come up as questions, the, um, the options when an insurance company offers to total your airplane and also the uncertainty that, that causes them to, uh, to potentially add quite a bit of, um, of percentage to an estimate initially and how we can reduce that? It's up to you, Bill. If not, I can kind of talk to it. But since you've been the uh, the protagonist in that story recently as well. I'm sorry, that was for Bill Kniff, if he cares to. I think actually that's going to be uh, the next uh, thing from Bill, Bill Carpenter. Uh, when we start Bill Carpenter about next week? Yeah. Company. Well, that's true. That's true. The, um, the, the key thing in, in really brief just is that uh, if your insurance company says they'd like to total, there is typically, you, in many cases, you have the, you can say to the insurance company, can I buy my, my hell back? And they'll typically essentially say, yes, you can be first in line. Here's the price. And they'll give you the salvage value. Chris, I think I'm on now. Yep, you are. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. There's a whole, there's a whole, <clears throat> there's a whole pattern that goes on with the insurance company when you make a claim. And that what, what, what Avemco does is that they, they review your coverage <clears throat> and they review the point that they that they they will pay up to, uh, but you got to give an, an estimate on it. Okay, <clears throat> so typically with them, it's seventy percent of your insured value. If the cost of repair is greater than that, the plane is total. The second thing in my case was that <clears throat> since. Uh, it was water getting into the landing gear due to the uh, Florence flood. <clears throat> There's, they have a whole, uh, a whole protocol <clears throat> on how, how to handle those things. And typically, they do not want to, uh, they want to total out air, the airplane because statistically, they find out in two or three years later, little things happen and they, they have another insurance claim that they have to pay for, okay? <clears throat> now, in, <clears throat> since I, I talked them into letting me keep the airplane, 
<coughs> and submitted a pretty and had submitted a pretty uh, detailed costing thing. <coughs> the total cost uh, on on the airplane that they would cover was forty two thousand dollars. The estimate, if the, if the, they worked on it, came out to four. $41,890. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> now ha having worked your way through that, <clears throat> then the next thing is, I said, hey, can I buy the airplane back? And <clears throat> the way that they do that is they, they estimate the salvage value on, on the airplane and deduct that from <clears throat> from the total insurance and <clears throat> uh, and you, you, you'll get that money uh, back so just to give numbers in general here <clears throat> that for <clears throat> it's sixty thousand dollars <clears throat> they had the salvage value of sixteen thousand therefore <clears throat> They, 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 they would pay me the difference and I, I would I would own the airplane and they wouldn't own it. So I think that, that that's the kind of range of things. There are one of, there's one other condition that I they talked about that I didn't quite understand <clears throat> is that <clears throat> if they totally under some conditions, the airplane is then put up for auction and the salvage people come in. And, and work on it. And some of the numbers that I understand that happens there is that the insurance company <clears throat> will, will pay you your, your full amount of money and then they, they will get back maybe 10, 15% on the salvage value. <clears throat> and the plane then will be, uh, then, then they'll, the salvage people will take it apart and do whatever they're gonna do with it. <laughs> So I, I, I think that that's the range of things from total totaling it of why they would total it to uh, working out an arrangement with you so that you can keep the airplane and this is how much money you will get, but it'll be reduced by the, what they estimate the salvage value is. <clears throat> and if, if there are any questions on that, it, and incidentally, it's a very emotional experience. When, when you start thinking of how much money is coming out of your pocket one way or the other. And especially in my case, the plane has been sitting for about a year trying to get a, a ferry permit and some other things done. So it, it hasn't been a, a, a pleasant or a positive experience. And I think what, what, what Will is going through here, I think that we, the Northeast tribe should should kind of document some kind of thing so that there'll be a general guide <clears throat> to people who, who get the, uh, the, who run into these kind of tasks. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Bill. That is great information. I think the key is to understand that uh, many times we assume that our airplanes, if they're totaled, are gone. And there is an opportunity to go to the insurance company and say, um, "Is you know, can I keep the airplane, the totaled airplane, um, based on its salvage value?" And then you get the remainder of your insured value to uh, to attempt to restore your airplane. Um, and then a number of times I've been told that sometimes there are ways to get things done maybe with more sweat equity that can be less expensive and provide options for us to keep beloved airplanes that we might otherwise lose. So just know that there may be more options than there appear at first. Yes. Um, yeah. Jason Rossback asks, oh yeah. Oh, I was just gonna jump Go ahead. And just add one thing. An interesting question that I am I'm approaching uh, in it, I kind of hit on it in the presentation is, um, you know, my estimates climbing not very quickly, but it's, uh, there's just the, you know, there's things that just go missing that we're looking for and we're spending time trying to find them, ordering these parts. Um, but the insurance company has blessed off on the work, like quite a bit of the work already. So, and it's, it's been underway. So a question that I will get from the adjuster because it's very relevant to my situation right now is what happens when we start 
piercing your kind of arbitrary threshold of like, we will not pay more than this. What happens when you've already agreed to pay, you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of work, you've already agreed to that. So what happens to the salvage value of the plane? Um, how much am I gonna have to pay now? I mean, it's, it's an interesting question and I'll, I'll, I should have an answer for it by the time I do the, the insurance zoom. I'm gonna try to, I think I'm gonna do the recovery one or the rebuild one and then the insurance one last because I think I told, I told you CZ, I'm trying to collect as much data about the insurance process as possible before I kind of share it with everybody. I have a quick, I have a quick question yes. for you, Will. Um, what percentage of, of the total damage to your airplane do you think was done during the landing and the, and the rollout and all that stuff versus what percentage would you guess was done during the recovery? Just, just a rough estimate. Um, it's hard to say. It might be, I mean, I, mine was kind of an exceptional case because the plane, all of the damage was almost exclusively linked to the, like the antennas on the skins and like some antennas got pulled off on the belly. Whereas, you know, the damage that the recovery team did was dents and scratches and other stuff. So, I mean, it, both, it, both, it was both in both situations, it was not very much. I think usually what you're going to find is the, the pilot will probably, I mean, as long as you get a Comanche recovery team, the pilot's going to be doing more damage than the recovery team. Um, usually quite a bit more, but at mine was kind of like a best case scenario where it, it was only because I went through that really thick grass at the very end that caught some of the antennas. If I hadn't touched that at all, then the recovery team would have done hundred percent of the damage to the plane. Um, I see. It's probably close to 50, 50 though. 50, 50. Wow. Okay. Oh yeah. I was, I, I was thinking back, back to your original presentation and you said, you know, I, I busted some antennas off, off the, you know, off the belly of the plane. And I'm just thinking, wow, you know, and now we're, we're in the totaling the airplane uh, regime there. And, uh, so is there any liability to the, uh, to, the, to the recovery team for a 50% of your total cost uh, resulting from the damage uh, due to, uh, I guess you'd call it malpractice or whatever you want to call it. You're the lawyer. I don't know what you'd call it. But, uh. Yeah, I mean, I guess it'd be their negligence. But I think that um, I was talking to CJ about this last night. I think that comes out of their slice of the pie. So they have their quote. And then if you know, the insurance company starts paying for damage that they cost. They probably have some sort of agreement about how much damage they can cause. But if they exceed that, they're probably start starting to eat into their profits. But the thing that costs the most of the recovery isn't the damage, it's the reassembly. I mean, right. um, I, I was actually just pulling up the most recent estimate because I was curious. And it is uh, hundreds of hours of labor that we're talking about. So it doesn't take that much creativity to figure out the math and what that's going right. to cost. So, yeah. Anybody, I mean, I know Paul's going okay. through. I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, sidebar this too much. But yeah, I was just curious. Right. what the overall, the overview was uh, recovery versus actual aircraft damage, and uh, that's uh, pretty so, impressive. So, uh, what I'll do for you is I will. I'll give you that comparison when I do the recovery one, because I can go into the quote and look at, or the estimate and look at what it actually, what actual damage was done. I haven't done that up for this one, but I can give you a probably more precise percentage after I look at it again. Because yeah, my, my vision was, hey, uh, you know, a few antennas and take the wings off and put them back on. And, and it just doesn't seem like, uh, I don't know, it just seems a little steep, let me put it that way. <laughs> you know? I, I think that part, part of what is so valuable about this uh, Comanche Zoom, and this was why in the very beginning I mentioned it was unexpected, is that as context, we have been working on a, an insurance group buy for two years since an astute former AOPA legal advocate said, go do these, <laughs> go do this. And the insurance companies in, in, and the insurance company industry or the insurance industry right now is in just a place that, that was unexpected at the time when we started on this. And so they're interested 
and supportive, but they said this year is just such a weird year that we're all just gonna try to survive this year and then we wanna try to do something next year. In the meanwhile, what they did say is we get nervous when a couple of things happen. One is when you become rare. So we need to try to save as many airframes as possible. Two is when your parts get uncertain because it costs us money, particularly if you have a clause in your insurance that says we will rent you an airplane while your airplane is in for repairs, which some of them do. They said parts delays, part shortages um, look very expensive to us. So try to maintain your part supply which there's a lot of good things going on in that area for Comanches. We're very fortunate to have good support, but the insurance companies don't necessarily know that and it makes them nervous. And it's part of why the, the recent initiatives to try to ensure that we have parts that they're reasonably priced and that we can locate them is critical to our uh, future as insurable aircraft. And so, and then some of what's coming out right now, like, like how, do we, how do we make sure we have recovery teams? How do we make sure we do minimal damage in recoveries is, is also so critical. You can, and you can see the feedback loop. The more airframes we can, the, the cheaper, the less damage we do in recovery, the cheaper the repair, the more airframes that we, we save, the happier the insurance companies are and, and the more secure they feel, the cheaper our insurance, the longer our future. Kind of a virtuous cycle. Go ahead. My annual insurance for, for the PA 30T I have is, is, has gone up. Well, the last, I just got it last week. It was almost $500. And I, I don't think I, I became a worse pilot or crashed the airplane. So I, you know, I did go down to the airplane and check, make sure I hadn't crashed it and forgot I did, you know, but uh, yeah, yeah I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on. It is a weird year. Uh, you know. Yeah. Yours is one of the lower increases for a PA 30 that I've heard of. Hi, Caramba. Yeah, exactly. There was a huge spike right around Christmas time and really? New Year's and it's starting to come back down. Oh, good. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, no guarantees there. That's an impression. Well, I, Go ahead. I, I did, it does that pretty much across the board with the people that you've talked to, they've got whacked pretty hard this year. Yes, the twins, the light twins in particular, they simply stopped insuring some of them. Um, the Moonies took a huge hit. These guys are seeing doubles on their premiums, a lot of them. It's, it's a little all over the board. Um, we were able to do some intervention. Uh, there was a very, very weird thing that happened with the ICS where somebody got to be president and literally ordered all of the competing recurrent type training, which happened to be the established program, deleted for two years. Um, and we were able to communicate that there would that the, the recent spike in Comanche accidents was due to no fault of the, of the Comanche drivers. There had simply been a an interruption, and that and that it was being addressed. But okay. um, it you know so it's it's some of it is an, a cyclical industry. Uh, some of it is there's some possibility of cyclical uh, increases in accidents, independent related to just turnovers in the airplane that are regular, and then removing. Uh, the majority of the recurrent type training uh, listing so that nobody knew about it uh, certainly would only affect the accident statistics in one direction. So it's well, being worked on. Overall, um, and I don't mean to pigeonhole here, but I always do anyway. Uh, are, those, are those statistics based on, say, light twins as a category, or are they just picking on the, 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 the twin Comanche uh, just for fun or profit or whatever their motive is? Um, I don't know. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, I was told by the insurance companies that some light twins, they have simply declined to insure. Wow. And so those pilots got a warning that's, you know, because there's regulatory requirements ahead of time. I don't know if David Asman's in here, but there are requirements that if you're going to do something like that or do a big premium increase that you have to send people a letter giving them a heads up and it'll come from your underwriter, not from your broker. Sounds like flight safety is trying to drum up some business. You know, they, they, they basically, the insurance company basically raise the rates incredibly high for cabin class twins unless you attend flight safety or some other simulator school and all that mm -hmm. so maybe they're going to try to follow that pattern 
there's a there's a I will add one more piece of information and then I'm going to try to get us back onto recovery. Um, the insurance zoom uh, was done by Dwight Coombe, who's been in the insurance industry uh, business for a long time, and he made clear that the aviation insurance industry is tiny, a tiny portion of overall insurance. And so we don't have a lot of leverage, but in addition, there is only one bucket and GA is in the same bucket with the majors. And so when the 737 MAX 8 happened, that actually rippled right down through to GA. So there's both a big picture, we're in this bucket with, with huge, huge things, just kind of swimming around. Um, and then there is, uh, and then as I started to work the group by, it became clear that different underwriters have different levels of interest in the statistics for individual types. And so our leverage is that we actually look like we've got a group that's interested in following really, really some good best practices that should make us much safer. And there appear to be approximately four underwriters that are interested in our statistics. And that will actually help us because we've been gathering them. So stay tuned and keep your fingers and toes crossed. All right, sign me up. <laughs> Good deal. Um, we may end up in a co-op for a while. Go ahead. Can I just make one comment? So I just, Rob said something early on about um, the cost of the, the, the recovery or like the total like claim and everything. And one thing I mentioned in the presentation just very briefly, and I'll touch upon it more in the, uh, the rebuild Zoom is that a lot of times when you put you when you put your command sheet not on a runway somewhere that's you know a field or whatever it actually qualifies mm -hmm. for a piper you know command sheet hard landing inspection and that is what hikes the rate or the the cost of the uh the, the insurance claim quite significantly um so it's not just like putting the wings in putting the stabilator back on and putting the rudder back on and getting a new engine and just you know you're off to the races that there's a lot of you know pulling stuff apart looking at it sending the engine mount out for an IRAN. And I'll go through all of that in more detail. I can tell you exactly what is included in that in the next Zoom, but that is a huge, a huge contributing factor in the, the high price of the, uh, the, the insurance claim after like an off-airport landing. Hmm. Yep. CJ, uh, from the chat window. Um, oh, go ahead, Hank. Uh, one correction. Uh, we are not gr grouped with the airlines alone. We're also grouped with the spacecraft. So every time some <laughs> five five million dollar uh, satellite blows up on the pad, we get to pay for it. Part of oh, it. Oh man, <laughs> Hank, thank you for providing that very cheering information. <laughs> <laughs> and one other thing that uh, I have seen discussed, but I think I'll stick it in here is that you can negotiate when you're buying your uh, the, um, uh, insurance uh, to ask them, they might say yes, they might say no, to have a right of fir first refusal uh, when they go to sell a scrap. A good point. And Pat Kiefer reinforces what Hank Spellman just said. She makes it a requirement that they have a right of first refusal on the salvage. Uh, just to establish that it's a right, not just in a, a negotiation. Well, you have to negotiate to get it in there, but once it's in there, they're they're obliged to. Uh, yes, honor. yeah, you're right. I should have said a negotiation at the time. Um, yeah, thanks for adding that, Hank. Those are both really good points. Um, from Russ Greenlaw, a really really great question with respect to lifting points. Consider removing the top cowl and lifting the forward part by the engine mount uh, or nose wheel structure. No easy solution for aft lift. Um, so that's, that's, that sounds like a great point. Um, the, the one off the cuff, the one caution again is if you're in a hurry to get the airplane moved, um, uh, that we just need to figure out how long it would take to do that. Um, a question for Will, um, did the insurance company ask if flying it out of the field was a possibility? Obviously with the hole in the engine, it wasn't, but did they ask? Um, no, it didn't, it didn't come up because I was pretty forward with them with what happened. Because by the time I had called them, I had actually opened up uh, the cowling and looked at, you know, 
looking for where the issue was, I, I was trying to figure it out. Once I realized the plane wasn't you know, at risk of catching fire or anything like that, I started doing my own investigation because um, I wanted to know what happened. And then I relayed that. So I, it didn't even come up. It was never on the table. I mean, I don't know that I would have tried it if they had put it. I, I probably would have recommended against it based on the, uh, the kind of the topography of that field. Um, but I don't know. And I, and I think that's something you probably have to work out with probably the FAA the municipality. And I, I'm just, I'm guessing here because you're not, you're flying a, uh, an aircraft off of a, you know, unapproved surface, so to speak, but it, it never hmm. came to answer the question. Interesting question though. Um, a, uh, a really good one from Ryan Draffrey. Is it possible to lift and haul on a trailer in one piece sideways? I've seen ag planes hauled like that before. Uh, the, the length of a Comanche would probably cover. Ryan, do you happen to know how long those ag planes were that were being hauled sideways? I think we would pick up two lanes. Oh. The wings are about 38, 38 feet from side to side. Yeah, but he's saying if you do it sideways, then you're just basically covering from the tip of the spinner to the uh, back of the stabilator, the trim tab. Uh, yeah, interesting question. I guess with appropriate flaggers, it's, it's a good question. And then uh, Russ Greenlaw adds on helicopters, he's seen them used for placing air conditioners on roofs and they're used for lifting logs out of forests. So maybe four tons at a time. So the cost must be economical for certain jobs. Uh, I personally would investigate it if I were to have the need, which I brain did never have. Um, and Andy White adds, helicopters a viable option. Watched an airplane recovered from levee to airport and placed onto hardpoint jacks, minimal to no additional damage. A heavy lift helicopter is usually not needed with our light aircraft, depending on external load weight. A light or medium lift helicopter is sufficient. And John Futter, or if you're still here, uh, let's see, hphelicopters.com, they're Western US uh, the website mentions inaccessible aircraft and asset recovery service. Uh, don't see mention of cost. Um, hmm. So I guess we have an assignment for next week uh, to go and find out uh, what, what the cost would be to get a, a helicopter in and over a certain distance. Anybody want to take that up for next week? <laughs> All right, we'll take it on as an if we can. We'll contact hphelicopters.com and just uh, see if we can get uh, their thoughts on distance, because I'm sure it's going to you know, have to do with how far they have to fly, as well as our lift. Um, Was that company on the West Coast somewhere that, that I just heard? Yes. Yep. If anybody's got a moment, they can go to hphelicopters.com and then just come back with uh, and drop them a note. HP maybe maybe helicopters, huh? I'll, I'll check yep. it out. All right. Good deal. Right. Thanks, Rob. There, CG, there is another option that uh, is obvious once you think of it, and that is talk to the local uh, uh, police department, the county police or the uh, or the city police, depending, because this was done for an airplane that landed in uh, on one of my properties. Uh, and they just said, be here at three o'clock. We'll have the people here. And because there's no traffic at three o'clock. Well, this is three o'clock in the morning. There's no traffic. Uh, and they could get through everything without taking the wings off. Mm -hmm. And they just towed it. <laughs> um, although in in Will's case, he would have had to go over the guardrail, right? Oh, I guess no, dra drag it backwards and go the other way. It looked like he was up against a barbed wire fence. Uh, fixing a barbed wire fence is a lot uh, cheaper than fixing a uh, uh, an airplane. Yeah. Huh, well, I guess all this is gonna go into our recovery sheet. And by the way, the, the police departments can be uh, 
really easy to get along with, particularly in rural areas, uh, when you um, make contributions to the police department. There's always some piece of equipment they want, and you can buy it and give it to them. <laughs> Hank, you're officially appointed to oversee this thing that we're putting together. <laughs> um, okay, uh, John Futter just added helicopterexpress.com uh, in Georgia. So um, looks like we're gonna be gathering a, a site that says uh, recovery options, lift points, and, um, and then the addition from Will's insurance presentation uh, at the Zoom number four. Uh, Mike Ellis added, um, ah, <laughs> to the tale of woe, his insurance jumped from 1,200 a year to uh, 2,100 a year with no claims and uh, a single. Hey, CJ, um, command helicopter uh, in, uh, command helicopter in, uh, uh, Connecticut uh, came over and picked a, a tiger moth up out of the trees in uh, Skylark a couple of years ago. Command helicopter. It was a it was a huge unit and had two uh, giant blades and just hooked the helicopter by the tail and just uh, dropped it over. It was only a, it was a takeoff uh, loss of power and he landed in the top of the tree so the the unit was up fifty feet in the air. So they had to strap around the uh, ampanage and and move it over to Skylark and and gently lift it down on its on its nose and and no further damage based on the helicopter's move. But that's command helicopter in uh, just south of uh, Bradley. Oh, fabulous! So they're out there. And Andy White just volunteered to check with PJ's and Seller Brothers helicopters on the left coast. Um, <laughs> Dad. Just posted uh, a big warning that many times lifting by the engine mount results in a bent engine mount and the expense of an engine mount rebuild, which would be approximately $3,700. So looks like those lift points are, uh, are critical. I'm going to open the floor at this point. We've uh, gone through the chat window. Um, I'm just checking because I know I had jumped forward. Uh, there was one question from Jason Rossback that I thought was excellent. Well, if you only had liability and no hull insurance, would you have fixed the plane or bought another? Just curious if the repair is more expensive than another airplane of similar configuration. So this is a really interesting question because uh, my wife asked me just, you know, liability like insurance question aside she's like do you want to get a different plane like are you afraid of this plane and my perspective was i mean i survived with this plane so i kind of want to stay with it. it i mean it's kind of like a good luck charm at this point so to speak um so the emotional attachment is one one factor uh with regard to the cost um yeah i, I was telling rob that it, you know the plane does qualify for a hard landing inspection um do I think the plane needed one? I mean, I obviously wanted like the, the gear to get inspected thoroughly. Um, but since I knew the plane was gonna be down for the count for 90 days and I knew my insurance company was gonna cover it, I elected for it because it, it, it encompasses a lot of stuff. Like, like, you know, I ran in the engine mount. That thing hasn't been looked at in decades. So if this is an opportunity, I mean, I have to wait for the engine anyway, I have to wait you know, the three and a half months for the engine. And they got it, they have to take the engine off, they have to take the junk engine off to put the new one on. So I was like, well, might as well do that. Might as well, you know, do all these other things at the same time, because it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really a, I, w I, I wasn't sacrificing any downtime. If I only had liability, would I keep the plane? I, I think I probably would, because it was pretty much preserved. I, I think I would have very carefully selected. I mean, Matt, hindsight's twenty twenty, but I would have care very carefully selected the recovery team. I would have made sure I was there for the recovery, um, and I, I think I would have been more invested in the like the, the entire recovery process itself. I, just because, you know, I, I I know a lot more now. I know what everything I didn't know and all the mistakes I made. Um, but I think I would have saved the plane because it. I mean, one of the. Th the 
you know, for the first few weeks when I was waiting for the insurance company to come back and say whether or not they were going to total the plane or, um, you know, pay for the repairs, I was really hoping they weren't going to total it because the plane, I mean, you, you saw the pictures in the field, the plane was pretty much undamaged. And then when I, you know, had them look at the gear as part of the hard landing inspection, it was, you know, perfectly fine. And it was, I mean, I, I, I was pretty certain that was going to be the case. I mean, you never know because you're, you're going in a field. It's not, it's an unimproved surface, but I didn't, I didn't hit anything. And I had no reason to think that I slammed on the ground. And in, in the last zoom presentation, I said that it was probably one of the smoothest landings I had ever had in, the, in that plane. Um, I don't know if it was the, uh, the pucker factor or whatever the case was, but I, I was on it in that instance. And I, I don't think if I just said liability only, I would scrap the plane and get a new one between the emotional attachments and the fact that the plane was really undamaged. So that answers the question. That's a great question. I'm gonna throw one thing in here just because um, it's, uh, I think it'll be amusing. We started to notice that there was an exceptionally large number of military pilots choosing the Comanches and, uh, you know, pilots in the majors and, you know, 135 and 121 pilots choosing the Comanche. And so we started to ask, why the Comanche? Why not get something else? And the answers almost universally were the same two points in opposite order. The military pilot said, because I like the way it flies and it's built so damn tough, and, or no, I've got this backwards. The military pilot said, because it's built so damn tough and I like the way it flies. And the commercial pilots all said, because it flies more like what I fly for work than anything else I can find. And because it's built so damn well. So there you go. <laughs> just in support of what you just said, Will, you're in good company. Um, it is uh, past 9.30 and thank you everybody who has stayed with us. Um, for all this time. And Will, thank you again for another amazing mm -hmm. presentation that only you could have done. Mm -hmm. Nice discussion. We should... yeah. uh, we could leave the meeting a little bit, but we this, this will give our volunteers who do the, uh, the recordings and the post-processing a chance to actually get this done and get some sleep. <laughs> um, so we'll, uh, we'll keep the meeting up for a few minutes for those who want to just talk and say goodbye. But uh, thank you so much, everybody, and Will Thanks in particular. Much, I appreciate it. Okay, I'm going yeah. to stop the recording at this point, and uh, it will be available tomorrow on the website if you want to go back and review it. Good night.